Alright. Is there any foolish trespasses today? Nah. Right. That noise is a bit weird, isn't it? Crasis <laughs> was hanging about in his new sanctum, staring into a gleaming emerald crystal that allowed him to view whatever land, whatever individual he desired. Unfortunately, wherever he looked, he saw devastation. Azeroth had been ravaged by several wars. First the green-skinned behemoths called orcs had invaded the world. They would have got away with it too, if it wasn't for the formation of the human-led coalition known as the Alliance. After the orcs were defeated, there was a period of relative peacetime, but, as is always the case during peacetime, a whole bunch of infighting then started, with members of the coalition vying for power over one another. People doing a hell of a lot of yelling at others, whilst doing almost zero introspection whatsoever. Although, Krasis had to admit, part of that had been the fault of the dragons, or mainly one dragon, Deathwing, sneaking about, pretending to be some bloke, and manipulating everyone. But that opportunity wouldn't have existed for him, if it weren't for the greed and desire of humans, elves and dwarves. And then, the Burning Legion came, attacking alongside their monstrous pawns, the Undead Scourge. It took everyone, including the Orcs, coming together to prevent total annihilation. Krasis then waved his hand over the crystal, summoning a vision of the Orcs. They were in Kalimdor now, a distant continent across the sea. Already they'd built several stone structures, not the most extravagant buildings, but Orcs had spent so long being nomads and prisoners, luxury to them was having a place to live. Krasis then noted some Orcs tilling a field. Orc farmers, he thought. How wonderful. The region wasn't exactly lush, looked pretty barren to be honest, but still, he wished them all the best. Next, Krasis summoned a vision of a place much closer to home, Dalaran, or what was left of it anyway. The demons of the Burning Legion had completely devastated the capital of the wizards. Several of those Krasis had counted as friends had been slain. Leadership of the Kirintor was now in disarray, which was something Krasis knew he himself would probably have to step up and lend a hand with at some point. So all in all, pretty shit state of affairs really. Krasis then dismissed the scene-setting exposition crystal so that the story could start, and shifted into his true Coriolstra's dragon form, so people who haven't watched the Day of the Dragon series are all caught up. And then... Coriolstra's! And bloody hell was that all about, Krasis thought. He looked around the huge chamber, but nothing. He was alone. Coriolstra! I hear you! What do you want? The disembodied voice did not respond, but Krasis could sense the sheer desperation in it. So he concentrated really hard and tried to establish a link with this stranger who so badly needed his help. Sense me. Give me some indication of what's wrong. The dragon mage then felt the barest touch. The stranger had accepted the link on their end. And then an absolutely overpowering presence knocked Krasis on his ass. This being's magic dwarfed his own a thousandfold. It felt as if time itself surrounded him in all its terrible majesty. Oh, great. I hear you, Nazdormu. Tell me what's wrong. Rather than respond with words, the aspect of time sent a whole bunch of astonishing images which filled Krasis's mind, the force of which proved too much, and so he passed out. We did it, folks. We've won Richard Nat Bingo. Several minutes later, Krasis picked himself up from the floor, feeling a little bit groggy, and as his mind cleared, he realised what had just happened. Nosdormu, the Lord of Time, had been desperately crying out for aid. And for some reason, he'd picked Krasis, a lesser dragon. Why? Why not Alexstrasza? Or Asira? Krasis then tried again to reach out to the great dragon, but that just caused his head to start spinning again. A mystery was afoot, one which required investigation. But Krasis was going to need some help. Someone who could adapt readily. And immediately, one individual sprang to mind. A human. A wizard. Ronin. Meanwhile, in Kalimdor, a bold elderly orc sat by a smoking fire. A shaman named Kalthar. 
just as his father had taught him, who had in turn been taught by his father, and so on and so forth, Kalthar went ahead and sprinkled some bone dust over the fire, added a few berries, and inhaled the fumes. Voices then murmured in the old shaman's head, spirits of the world, whispering anxiously, warning of something. But what? He had to know more. Kalthar then added the final ingredient, a bunch of black leaves from a plant that only existed in the orc's homeworld, and instantly, the smoke turned blue. This was some potent shit. But Kalthar went ahead and leaned forward, allowed the fumes to fill his lungs, and immediately started to trip balls. The world transformed. He was now a bird, soaring high over the landscape. And although initially he felt a sense of exhilaration, he felt young again, that feeling was quickly replaced by the sense that something was wrong. Something was there that should not be. And as the old bold shaman bird passed over a mountain range, he saw it. The thing that was causing him such anxiety. Some kind of water funnel. Was somehow swallowing and disgorging simultaneously. And the thing that it was drawing in and spitting out was time. Days, weeks, months. Disappearing and then re-emerging. Kalthar was so shocked by what he saw that he failed to notice the maelstrom was actually now pulling him towards it. But once he realised, he started to flap. He flapped his old bald wings with all of his might. But still, the funnel continued to pull. In desperation, Kalthar called out to the spirits, praying they give him the strength he needed. And sure enough, they did. <gasps> the orc opened his eyes and realised he was back by the fire again. No longer an old bald bird, being sucked down the world's plug hole. I must tell Thrall. Quickly. Else we lose our home. Our world. Again. Balls. What? What is it? Ronin grimaced to himself. Ronin? It's... It's twins. Twins? That's amazing. I don't think you understand, Farisa. Twins. From a mage and an elf. Elves seldom give birth. And we very, very rarely give birth to twins, my love. They'll be destined for great things. I know. That's what concerns me. Farisa considered that for a moment, and then realised she kind of knew where Ronin was coming from. The two of them had been involved in a whole bunch of great things themselves. Their infiltration of Grim Batol, rescuing the Dragon Queen Alex Straza. After that, they travelled from realm to realm, acting as ambassadors of sorts, trying to keep the Alliance intact. And then, Warcraft 3 happened. Both of them had lost friends, their families. But it wasn't all shit, because despite all of that loss and pain and hardship, they'd grown closer together. So close, in fact, that they were married now and about to have twins. You wizards, always seeing the dire. I thought my people were gloomy. This is a good thing, Ronin. Farisa's confidence and hope never ceased to amaze Ronin, especially after everything that had happened to her. Her uncle and younger brother had been ripped apart by ghoulish corpses. No one knew exactly what had happened to her parents, but they too were presumed dead. Farisa had already lost one sister during the Second War, but the other one? Well, there were some nasty rumours floating around about her. The official version of events was that Sylvanus died valiantly, attempting to prevent Arthas and his army from assaulting Silvermoon. That was where the story ended, as far as Verisa was concerned. But Ronin had heard disturbing news. A surviving ranger had been found babbling about how she'd been captured, not killed. Horribly mutilated. Her body and soul corrupted into a banshee. Ronin had so far been unable to verify these rumours, so he wasn't going to tell his wife about them anytime soon. Perhaps once they're born, I'll feel better. I'm probably just nerve- Ronin! I'll piss off, Crisis! Oh, for shit's sake. Ronin! I'm not gonna help you! I've done my share! You know I can't leave her now! Before you reject me, let me show you. Let me show both of you. Before Ronin could protest, images then filled his and Varisa's mind. First, they relived the experience that Crisis had, one chapter ago. And that was followed by images of Kalimdor. The whole thing probably only lasted a few seconds, but twas exhausting. And Ronin felt a surge of anger as his heavily pregnant wife slumped back with a gasp. I'm all right. Just breathless. Give me a moment. Take your quest to someone else, Crisis. 
I've got far more important things to worry about. There was silence for a moment, causing Ronin to wonder if Crisis had indeed buggered off to find someone else. But that silence was then broken. You have to go, Ronin. I'm not going anywhere. You saw what I saw. It does not summon you for some frivolous task. Crisis is worried, and what worries him puts fear into me. I'm not going to leave you, or them. The last thing I want is for you to thrust yourself into danger. I do not desire to sacrifice my children's father, but whatever this is, it's a threat to the world they'll be born into. If I was not in this condition, I would go with you. You know that. Crisis is strong, even stronger as Coriolstras. It gives me comfort to know that he'll be with you. Come on, Ronin. You know he would not ask if he did not think you capable. These were all very good points, Ronan thought. All right, I'll go. Gracious, I'll help you. Where should we rendezvous? Suddenly, Ronan was in a completely different place. Right, I guess we rendezvous here then. There's a pack containing rations and water for you. Just over there. Grab it and follow me. Barely had a chance to say goodbye to my wife. You have my sympathies. Ronan right inside, grabbed the pack and then followed Crasis out of the cavern. He could now see that they were in a very familiar looking mountain range. <laughs> we're almost neighbours. A coincidence. But it made bringing you here possible. Had I sought to transport you to the lair of my queen, the spell work would have been much more depleting. And I very much wish to retain as much of my power as possible. These images you sent. Have you managed to contact Nosdormu since? No. That's why we must use every precaution. In fact, we can't use magic to transport ourselves to the location. We will have to fly. How are we going to fly if we can't use magic? Crisis then shifted, changing into his true dragon form. Right, yes. Forgot about that. Climb atop, Ronin. We must be off. And so, off they musted. And as Coriolstras beat his great webbed wings, Ronin contemplated what lay ahead. What could distress the Lord of Time so much? And what could a mortal wizard possibly do to help? Several hours later, Ronin woke up from a little nap and realised that Coriolstras was making his descent. However, all the human mage could see was water. No land. And for a moment, he wondered if his dragon companion was about to land like a duck. But a rocky, ominous island then came into view, the sight of which caused Ronin a little bit of anxiety. Coriolstras then landed, and Ronin dismounted. How soon before we move along? Not until sunrise. We must pass near the Maelstrom to reach Kalimdor. And for that, we'll need our wits about us. And our strength. This is the only island I've seen for some time. What's it called? I'm not sure. Coriel Strauss then settled down as Ronin eyed some nearby ruins. Very dark, spooky ruins. Something tragic happened here. You sense it too? Yes. What it was, I cannot say. But we should be secure up here and I have no intention of transforming. That provided Ronin with some comfort. He was going to stay as close to this dragon as he possibly could. Ronin then settled down and stared up at the night sky, with thoughts of his wife and future children filling his mind. The twins were not long due now, so hopefully they could wrap up whatever the hell this mission was fairly quickly, because he sure as hell wasn't going to miss their births. However, the thought of those two as yet unborn twins then became a little bit more vivid, because Ronin had drifted off into a slumber and started to dream, despite the fact he was asleep for several hours only a few paragraphs ago. In this dream, Ronin and the children were frolicking in the countryside. At least, he assumed they were his children. Having not been born yet, they didn't really have distinguishable faces. Papa! Papa! This is nice, Ronin thought. Papa! Papa! What the bloody hell was that all about? Wake, Wake up! up. Ronin's head was pounding. Ronin, Ronin wake, wake up. up! The two ugly twins then drew closer, the sight of which caused Ronin to awaken from his slumber with a gasp. However, as he lifted his head, he found himself face to face with another nightmare. Papa. Ronin, what the hell was that thing? I believe it was one of those that called this place home. Are you saying that thing was once Hume? You've seen the horrors? Unleashed by the Scourge? Is this their work, then? No. This is much older. Even more unholy an act than the Lich King ever perpetrated. I think it entered my dreams, Crisis. 
manipulated them. Yes, others sought to do the same with me. Others? Ronan thought. Well, that ain't good. How many others are there? We can't stay here. No, you're right. We must move on to Kalimdor. So, Ronin went ahead and climbed back aboard, and the pair took off. When we've succeeded with our mission, I'll return here. End this abomination. There are already far too many abominations in this world. Greetings. How may I assist you who honor my presence, Great One? Only by listening, War Chief. Truly listening. Old Bold Kalthar went ahead and told Thrall of his vision from Chapter 1, of the water funnel sucking up time, of the voices and their warnings, of the wrongness he'd felt with it all, and finally, he told Thrall of what he feared would happen if the situation was left unchecked. And once he was finished, Thrall paced backwards and forwards a bit, taking a moment to consider it all. The smells of magic. Big magic. Something for wizards, maybe. They may know already. But we cannot afford to wait for them, Great War Chief. You would have me send someone to this place you saw? It would seem most prudent. At least so we know what we face. Right. I think I may know who. A good warrior. Thrall then turned to address some guards. Brox. Get me Brox. Meanwhile, after several more hours of flying, Ronin and Coriel Stras were now soaring above the landmass that is Kalimdor. Ronin had noticed that his dragon companion was flying with much more urgency since reaching the continent. What he didn't know, though, was that Coriel Stras had attempted, and failed, to contact Nos Dormu multiple times. But all they could do now was press on. Soon enough they would arrive, and find out for themselves what distressed the aspect of time so much. However, down below... A dragon. A red one. With a rider. Is it one of us, Brox? An orc. Broxigar snorted. His companion was far too young to know anything about orcish dragon riders. He'd likely only ever heard stories of the Second War, and therefore had a pretty romanticised view of the whole thing. Brox, on the other hand, was a veteran of all three wars, his actions in the third one being particularly notable. He'd pretty much single-handedly held a vital mountain pass against hordes of demons. By the time orcish reinforcements arrived, he was the only survivor, standing there alone, scarred and covered in blood, like a vision out of the old tales of his race. Don't be a fool. The only way a dragon would carry an orc these days would be in his belly. Whoever they are, they're headed for the same place as us. How do you know that? Where else would they be going here? The other orc, named Gaskell, went silent, mainly because he couldn't think of any argument against that, whilst Brox considered their next move, with a grim smile forming across his face. What Thrall had not known about this war hero when summoning him to aid in this quest was that Brox suffered from terrible guilt. Guilt that had eaten at his soul ever since the day in that mountain pass. Come on. Let's get a move on. We can reach them before they get settled in. And if they give us any trouble, we'll make them think the entire horde's on the rampage again. As the dragon descended, Ronin surveyed the land. This region seemed a dire place indeed, but... There was something else the wizard could sense. Sensations flowed into the wizard that just felt completely and utterly wrong, as if the very fabric of reality had made some kind of terrible error. Coriel Strauss then landed, and Ronin dismounted. However, the wizard's legs kind of gave way, and he fell flat on his face. Are you alright? I'm fine. Just... that was a long journey. I forgot how to use my legs for a moment. Ronin then did a few stretches and squats, whilst Coriolstras strode off to scout the area a bit. And after a few moments, Krasus appeared, in his not-dragon form. There were several unstable areas nearby. This form was less likely to cause them to collapse. I can always transform back if necessary. Did you find anything? I sense the aspect of time. He's here, and yet, he's not. And that disturbs me. Should we start- <laughs> What the shit? Let's move on. Our goal's not far. Are we not flying? Whatever we seek lies within a narrow passage between the next mountains. The dragon would not fit. So, with Krasis leading the way, the pair head northeast, and soon enough, they came upon the passage that Krasis had mentioned. It was narrow indeed, 
One would be forgiven for thinking it was some kind of video game loading gate. Are we nearly there yet? Soon. It lies only... What? It's not... It's not exactly where it should be anymore. It moved? That would be my assumption. Is it supposed to do that? You are under the misconception that I know perfectly what to expect, Ronin. I know little more than you do. Great. So what do you suggest we do, then? We go on. It's all we can do. However, upon going on a bit further, the pair then came across a new and different complication. The path ahead of them split into two. Let me guess. You don't know which path we should take. They each run near to our goal, but I cannot sense which lies closer. We need to investigate both. So we split up, then? I would prefer not to, but we must. We each journey 500 paces in, then turn back and meet here. Hopefully that will give us a better sense of things. And so, Ronin took the corridor to the left, and followed Crisis' instructions, counting off each pace as he went. But to be honest, he'd barely taken any steps at all before his confidence that this was the right way started to grow. His senses may not have been as acute as Crisis's, but there was definitely an ever-increasing disturbance lying further down this path. The wrongness he sensed was getting stronger. And after a few more steps, something else caught Ronin's attention. Something ahead was moving. And not just that, it was moving towards him. Rapidly. Ronin felt it before he saw it. First he felt old, and then young, and then old again. And understandably, the wizard hesitated, because that was a weird sensation. But as an absolute barrage of colour and sound then came whirling round the corner towards him... Nope. However, a terrible howl then echoed through the passage, and a massive eight-legged wolf then dropped down ahead of Ronin, blocking his escape. What the shit? Ronin, the anomaly is expanding. It's almost upon you. Ronin glanced behind himself, and his eyes immediately widened. Some kind of wobbly distortion was drawing nearer and nearer, and beyond it, the landscape was different. I will, I will not, not reach, reach you in time, time but don't, don't worry. worry. I'm linked to you. To you. Cast, Cast a spell, spell of teleportation. teleportation. I'll, I'll guide, guide you to me. me. So, Ronin focused, picturing Crisis in his mind, and the spell began to form. However, the wobbly time anomaly expanded immediately, reacting to the spell work. Crisis! Break the link! Break it before- Ronin! Ronin! Balls! Come back to us, young one. You have learned well, Malfurion. Better than even I could have expected. The young Night Elf's mentor had insisted that they do this at the height of day, which, as the name would suggest, was a Night Elf's weakest point of time. Had they done this at night, it would have been a lot easier. But, that was the entire point. What Malfurion's mentor taught him was not the sorcery of his people, but almost the exact opposite. In many ways, Malfurion had already become the opposite of his people. Bit of an outcast, because he asked questions sometimes suggested that traditions were stupid, that maybe it was better to try new and different things instead of just doing the same old shit over and over again. He'd once even had the audacity to suggest that their beloved Queen Ashara maybe didn't always have the people's best interests in mind. So all in all, he didn't have a lot of friends. And by not a lot of friends, I mean he had three friends. And one of them was his twin. What did you see, brother? I saw the hearts of the trees, Illidan. Their souls, they're not just theirs either. I think, I think I saw into the souls of the entire forest. How wonderful, the second of the three friends gasped, causing Malfurion to fight desperately to keep his cheeks from darkening from embarrassment. For reasons he did not yet understand, he felt increasingly more uncomfortable around Taranda of late, whilst at the same time not really wanting to spend any time away from her, because she was very nice to look at, especially her boobies. <laughs> Is that all? It's a good start, Illidan, rumbled the tutor, Cenarius. Now, Cenarius was a demigod. That's pretty much all the trio of elves knew about him, though. He kept his origins to himself. You've all done well. Go now. Be among your own for a time. It will do you some good. 
So, the three night elves got up, but Malfurion then hesitated, looked to his companions and said, Go on ahead. I'll meet you at the trail's end. I need to talk with Cenarius. We can wait. There's no need. I won't be long. Then by all means. Illidan then took Taranda by the arm. Come, Taranda. Let's leave him be. Taranda gave Malfurion one last lingering glance, which again made him feel bloody weird. And then the two buggered off. My Shando, forgive me for asking. No need to be so formal, young one. You pay me even more homage than those who claim to preach in my name. Your brother does not bend to me, and for all her respect of my power, Taranda Whisperwind gives herself only to a loon. None of them truly follow the path I now show you. You are the first with the possible aptitude, the possible will, to truly understand how to wield the forces inherent in all nature. And when I say you, young elf, I speak entirely in the singular. But... But Taranda... And Illidan, as I said, Tyrande has promised herself to Elune. I will not poach in the moon goddess's realm. And Illidan, I can only say that there's much promise to him, but I believe that promise lies elsewhere. I... I don't know what to say. My Furion really didn't know what to say. The idea of not sharing the same path with his twin brother really didn't sit right with him. No. Illidan will learn. He's just more headstrong. There's a lot of pressure on him. His eyes are the sign of some future mark upon the world, but he will not make it following my teachings. Cenarius then gave Malfurion a gentle smile. But that won't stop you from trying to teach him yourself, will it? Who knows? Perhaps you can succeed where I failed. Again, Malfurion blushed. Of course his honoured teacher would figure that out. That was exactly what the young night elf intended to do. Now, he wanted to ask me something. Yes, I've been troubled by a dream. Only a dream. It comes to me every time I sleep. And since I've been learning from you, it's grown stronger, more demanding. Malfurion expected the Forest Lord to simply laugh at him, but instead, Cenarius studied him closely. And after a few moments of intense staring, the demigod leaned back and nodded. Yes, you are ready, I think. Ready for what? A couple of red birds then floated down and Cenarius whispered something to them and let them fly off. Illidan and Tyrande will be informed that you're staying behind for a time. They've been told to leave without you. Why? Tell me of your dream. And so, Arthurian went ahead and did that. The dream started, as always, with the Well of Eternity. At first, the waters remained calm, but a maelstrom then formed, with creatures bursting out from it. Creatures he did not recognise. And after that, Malfurion would find himself standing in the midst of Kalimdor. But a Kalimdor stripped of all life. Some great evil had laid waste to the entire land. And in that moment, Malfurion would turn and bear witness to vast fire, burning everything it touched. An inferno that was seemingly alive. Not only did it know the horrors it wrought, it revelled in them and hungered for more. And that was it. Malfurion then looked up at his mentor who now had a very serious look on his face. And this nightmare, it repeats itself with every slumber. Every one, without fail. I fear this is an omen, then. I sensed upon our first meeting that you may have the gift of prescience, but it's stronger than even I ever expected. So what does it mean? We shall try to discover that. As I said, I believe that you're ready. Ready for what? Ready to walk the Emerald Dream. The Emerald Dream, Malfurion thought. What the bloody hell was that? He'd never even heard of it. It's the world beyond the waking world. The world of the spirit. Of the sleepers. The world as it might have been if we sentient creatures had not come about to ruin it. It is called the Emerald Dream, for that is the colour of its mistress, Isira, the Great Aspect. She and her flight guard it well, and allow only a few to enter it. No night elf has ever walked it. You would be the first of your kind to truly take the path, if you so desire. Well, this was the most unnerving and yet exciting thing Malfurion had ever heard. On the one hand, it would be the next step in his studies of this druidism thing, and a way to make sense of this nightmare he'd been having, but it also sounded bloody mental. What... what might happen? What might go wrong? 
Even the experienced can lose their way back if they become distracted. Even I. You must remain focused at all times, Malfury. Know your goal, otherwise you may sleep forever. Malfury considered that for a moment. He suspected that there were more things that could go wrong that Scenarius was not saying, but... How do I start? You are certain? Yes. Very. And simply sit, as you have for your other lessons. I will guide you in this first time, but then it's up to you. Lock your gaze in mine, Night Elf. And so, Malfurion stared into the demigod's golden orbs, feeling himself being drawn into a world of endless possibilities, feeling an overwhelming sense of lightness fill him. Do you feel the songs of the stones, the dance of the wind, the laughter of the rushing water? No, Malfurion felt no such thing. But then a soft sound arose, the shifting of earth, some sharp toots of wind, flappy fish noises. You are not yet in the Emerald Dream. First you must remove your earthly shell. Start with your heart and mind, for they are the links that most bind you to the mortal plane. See? This is how it is done. Not quite sure how I'm supposed to visualize that, so we'll just go with Scenarius appearing stark bollock naked. Give way to your subconscious. Let it guide you. It knows of the realm of dream, and is always happy to return here. Mafiorin continued to do as he was told, so now he was also stark bollock naked. And a bunch of trippy shit happened for a bit, but I'd quite like to just get a move on with the story. So eventually, Malfurion found himself floating above the shores of the Well of Eternity. First, he surveyed the well itself. Then the capital of the Night Elves, Zinashari, which translates to the glory of Ashara. So beloved the Queen had been when she made her ascension to the throne, that the Night Elves had insisted on renaming the capital in her honour. Speaking of the Queen, Malfurion then noted her glorious palace and frowned, Contrary to what others believed, he did actually admire her. She'd done a good job. He just kind of felt like she'd lost focus. The real problem, Malfurion suspected, was with the Highborn, the elves that administered the realm in her name. However, as Malfurion floated closer to the palace and attempted to enter it, he discovered an impenetrable barrier, some kind of protective spell that was so powerful it wouldn't even allow him in this dream realm to pass through it which only made him more curious. So, he reached out and immediately screamed as a surge of excruciating pain shot through him. Everything around him immediately disappeared, leaving only an emerald void in its wake, and this void felt like absolute chaos, a storm of pure magic. Malfurion, you, you must return. return. Malfurion recognised Cenarius' voice and clung to it, latched onto it like a drowning person would a piece of driftwood, and luckily for him, that actually worked. The pain started to dwindle as Cenarius' touch grew stronger, and then... Oh! What happened, young one? You went even beyond my sight. Malfurion then tried to explain everything he'd witnessed, struggling to put it all into words. This does not bode well. Are you certain it was the palace? I... I can't help feeling that the Queen must be part of it. The Shara is strong-willed. Not even Xavius can control her. Think about what you're saying, young Malfurion. You are suggesting that Queen Ashara, the ruler of the Night Elves whose name is heard in song each day, is involved in something that could be a threat not only to your kind, but the entire world. Do you understand what that means? I understand one thing. I must find out the truth, wherever that truth leads, even if it costs me my very life. Meanwhile, the shadowy figure stared into a small golden sphere, and within it, an almost identical shadowy figure stared back. The realm is still in the midst of terrible throes. The night elves play with powers they do not appreciate. Has there been an opinion formed on your end? Nothing so far. What can they possibly do save destroy themselves? It would not be the first time one of the ephemeral races did so, and surely not the last. So it seems to us, and the others. All of the others. Even those of the Earth Order's flight. They keep their own counsel, as usual. They are little more than Altharian's reflection. Unimportant, then. We shall continue to monitor the Night Elf's folly. But it is doubtful it will amount to much more than the extinction of their kind. Should it prove to be more, 
I'm sure we will be ordered to act by our lord, Malikas. We too shall act, if commanded by her majesty, the glorious Kyphstrata. This conversation is over then. And with that, the conversation was over then, leaving just the first shadowy figure shaking its head at the ignorance of the lesser races. Foolish, foolish elves. Where the bloody hell did they go? How exactly does one hide a dragon? Brox thought. He and Gaskell had found some obvious tracks. Human footprint, possibly two. But they would have noticed if a dragon launched itself into the air, and they'd seen no such thing. Maybe that way? Through that pass? It's too narrow. But still, the smell of dragon definitely filled Brox's nostrils. He then kneeled down to get a closer look at the tracks. Despite the pass being too narrow, Gaskell's suggestion did in fact make the most sense. At least the riders had gone that way. It was pretty obvious that if the orcs confronted them, the dragon would surely come. And that was exactly what Brox wanted. Treaty or no treaty, this was a good day to die as far as he was concerned. Wasn't going to tell his companion that though. Let's go. So, the two trotted through the same video game loading gate from chapter 3, and almost immediately, they heard the monstrous howl of some kind of beast. And then... BALLS! Balls! Brox? However, as the two exited the narrow pass, their eyes widened at the sight in front of them. A wobbly distortion, engulfing everything. It usually takes quite a lot to put the pants-shitting goosey boots into an orc, but this was absolutely one of those things. Both orcs froze, immediately recognising that their simple weapons weren't going to help in this situation. Even Brox, who desired a heroic death, did not like whatever this was one bit. Gaskell, move, run! Unfortunately, Broxigar failed to follow his own command, because as he turned to run, he slipped and tumbled to the ground. Gaskell, however, did not notice that, and had started to cheese it. But, he'd obviously gone to the Scooby-Doo school of running away, because he was just kind of darting around like a maniac. Not there, you fu- Brox couldn't get all of his sentence out. A barrage of sounds cut him off. The horrific anomaly then expanded, and all Brox could do was watch in horror, as it completely enveloped his young companion. Gaskell's body started to stretch and contract, with his bones cracking and his eyes a-bulging, ungodly screams coming out of his mouth. At that point, Brox picked himself up and started to cheese it again, but the orc only managed a few steps before the wobbly distortion caught up with him. <laughs> every bone, every muscle, every nerve in Krasis' body was on fire. He had no idea what had just happened. One minute, he was trying to reach Ronin. The next, despite being nowhere near it, he'd been swallowed by the anomaly. And after that, he'd seen flashes of a whole bunch of nonsense. Krasis then took a moment to try and clear his mind, process the images he'd just seen, and immediately wished he hadn't done that, because in the midst of that swirling chaos... Krasis was pretty sure he'd seen Nosdormu, trapped like a fly in a web, fighting tooth and nail for his own survival, but also for the survival of everything else. The aspect of time was doing everything he possibly could to keep the fabric of reality from collapsing. Krasis then noted his surroundings. He was not in a mountain pass anymore, he was in a forest. A forest that was so weirdly peaceful it caused the dragon mage to wonder if perhaps he'd actually died. But... A not-so-heavenly sound then filled the air. What the shit? Are you injured, Ronin? Everything hurts, but nothing seems broken. Where are we? I'm not sure. I feel like I should know it, but... Oh. Crisis? What's wrong? It's nothing. Just not fully recovered yet. My weakness will pass. Crisis noted that Ronin already appeared to be sitting up and stretching, which didn't make a lot of sense. Why would a frail human be recovering faster than a dragon? So, with grim determination, Crisis also sat up and looked around. The region certainly did look familiar. Crisis was certain he'd visited it at some point. But when? When had he? However, the simple question of when then filled Crisis with sudden dread. Ronin, wait here. I'll scout from above, then return shortly. Is that wise? It's absolutely necessary. Crisis then stretched out his arms. <laughs> um, you need some privacy, or... I can't change, Ronan. 
I can't transform. Ronan frowned. You're still weak, Master Crisis. Trip through that thing. Yet you're standing. Take no offence from me, human, but what we passed through should have left you in a far worse state than me. But that, Ronin nodded. No offence taken. I just figured that you'd spent yourself trying to keep me alive. No, Ronin. Once we entered that thing, I could do no more for you than I could do for myself. In fact, if not for Nosdormu. Nosdormu? What's he got to do with our survival? You didn't see him? No. Crisis then described what he'd seen, and Ronin stood there with a big old shocked look on his face. Impossible. Terrifying. And now I must tell you that even if he did save us from the raw forces of the anomaly, I fear he did not send us back to where we came from. Oh, I can see that. Or even when. When? What do you mean, when? You saying we're in a different time? Yes. But as to what period, I cannot say. Nor can I say how we'll be able to get back to our own era. <sighs> Ronin slumped back down again, with nothing but thoughts of Risa in his mind. Have courage. I may not know how we are to get back, but that does not mean we will not try. But first, we should find shelter and sustenance. Maybe some knowledge of the land. If we can place ourselves, we might be able to calculate where to head next, to find help. So, Ronin helped Krasis up to his feet. The two discussed which direction they should take for a moment, and then they started to head north, towards some distant hills. About an hour later, the two came across a stream. Thank the five. I think we should rest here for the night. Yeah, but I don't think I can go much longer. But I can still create a fire for us. As enticing as that sounds, we should be warm enough in our garments. I'd rather err on the side of caution for the time being. Hmm. You're probably right. We could be in the time of the Horde's first invasion, for all we know. Seemed unlikely, Grace thought, considering the peacefulness of the woods. But the Horde weren't the only danger the world had faced in the past. Both Ronin and Krasis then settled, and almost immediately fell asleep. But Krasis's slumber was a troubled one. First, he dreamt of Nosdormu, struggling against that which was his very nature, with time itself growing ever more unstable. But in this dream, Krasis noticed something else. The fiery glare, eyes glazing hungrily on all that they saw. The dragon mage actually frowned in his sleep, as his subconscious tried to recollect why this image seemed so goddamn familiar to him. But just as Krasis was on the brink of remembering, the sound of metal clinking on metal woke him up. As soon as he opened his eyes, Ronin's hand clamped over his mouth. Grasis then looked at the wizard, confused for a moment, but the clinking metal sound happened again, and Ronin pointed upwards. The dragon mage looked up to see a whole bunch of shadows above them. Four creatures, or rather four riders, atop panther mounts. They were tall, very lean, clad in armour the colour of night. Grasis could not yet make out their faces, but they moved with a fluidity, a grace that you did not see in humans. They're hunting, probably for us, and they will see you before you clearly see them. Who are they? Night elves. One of the figures then turned and looked directly at them. Obviously, they'd heard that whispery conversation. So, Krasis immediately grabbed Ronin. Into the deeper woods, Ronin. It's our only hope. All chaos then broke loose, with elven shouts and panther roars. Ronin and Krasis cheesed it down the hill into a thicket, realising there were now more than a dozen buggers chasing after them. One of the elven riders rushed past the two and came to a halt in front of them, but Ronin went ahead and launched a quick fire spell, sending the bloke and his mount flying. However, more pursuers were rapidly approaching from behind, so Krasis tried to cast his own spell, a wall of flame. But instead of that, a bunch of almost useless small bonfires burst to life in random locations, and Krasis himself killed over in pain. Ronin pounced to the rescue, grabbing Krasis whilst repeating a weaker variation of Krasis' attempted spell. However, the human wizard's weaker variation garnered a pretty spectacular result. The woods bloody exploded with robust flames, causing the armoured riders to fall back in complete disarray. And Ronin looked just as startled by the results as the night elves did. They'll find a path around. They know this place well from the looks of it. What did you call them? Night elves, Ronin. Aren't they allies? We're not in the same time period, Ronin. Before their reappearance, it was thought by even the dragons that their kind had become extinct. 
after the end of... Crisis then became very subdued, realising he didn't particularly want to follow that thought to its logical conclusion. But luckily for him, he wouldn't have had the chance to anyway, because some elven riders then burst out of a bush, hit both the dragon mage and wizard over the head with heavy clubs, and the two passed out. Sometime later, Xavius wants them alive. I, Captain Varathen. They'll both survive the journey. Captain nodded. He was somewhat perplexed as to how the Queen's Counselor had managed to detect the presence of these strangers. Xavius had said that there had been some odd manifestation when he summoned Varathen and ordered him to bring back anyone unusual. And as Varathen eyed the prisoners, he certainly agreed that they were very unusual. One of them looked vaguely like a night elf, but with very pale skin. The other one, no idea what he was supposed to be. No matter. Lord Xavius will sort you out, even if he has to tear you limb from limb or flay you alive. Mafiorian returned to his slightly secluded home, not far from the elven settlement of Sorimar. It was a humble little place, formed from both tree and earth. A stark contrast to how a lot of other night elves lived nowadays. But as far as Malfurion was concerned, one was supposed to adapt to their surroundings, not force their surroundings to adapt to them. Probably another reason why he only had three friends, because he basically seemed like the Unabomber to most other elves. But anyway, Malfurion was still very troubled by what he'd seen in Chapter 4, within the Emerald Dream. Scenarius had attempted to try and offer an alternative perspective, lighten the mood a bit, the visions we see in the Emerald Dream, they can mean many things. Even what we think is real may not be so. The Dreamland often plays its own games in our limited minds. But, deep down, Malfurion knew. What he'd seen was definitely real. There was reckless spellcasting taking place within the Palace of Ashara, with a complete disregard of the potential damage it could do to the world. And it was extremely unlikely that the Queen wasn't part of it. However, Malfurion went ahead and tried to return to his normal routine, tried to forget his troubles, but as he sat down and took a sip of honey wine, something very large seemed to move across the field of moonlight. He immediately got up, rushed to his door and opened it, but nothing. No unusual creatures, no unusual sounds, no sign of any intruder whatsoever. Just my nerves, I suppose. Meanwhile, a very confused Broxigar made his way through a forest, his head absolutely pounding. He couldn't even begin to comprehend the things he'd just seen. Swirling chaos, voices and sounds and images that made zero sense, the fact that he was now in a forest instead of a mountain pass, or even the fact that he was alive whilst his young companion had been torn apart. But Brox was a warrior, with warrior's instincts, so he decided to just go ahead and follow them. His war chief would want to know what or who was responsible for the weirdness that had just happened because someone is usually responsible for magic stuff. So the question now was, was it an accident or was it intentional? In which case, who the bloody hell was threatening the orcs new homeland? Because they needed to die immediately. So Brox pushed forward. And after several hours of pushing forward, he stepped into a clearing to find himself face to face with a tall female figure, an elf clad in silver robes. Uh. <coughs> Before Brox even had a chance to reach forward and smother the lady's face, a whole bunch of cries and shouts filled the air. And suddenly, the old orc veteran was surrounded. Now a big part of Brox wanted to stand his ground, fight, and probably die due to being massively outnumbered, but that would also lead to him failing to complete his mission. So Brox snarled and bloody cheesed it. Obviously, the crowd of tall lean figures gave chase with a couple of them even overtaking the fleeing orc atop feline mounts. But Brox didn't give a shit. He simply grabbed one of the riders and tossed them directly towards the other one. However, just as Brox started to feel quite confident in the possibility of his escape, another elf appeared out of nowhere in front of him. They raised one hand to chest level, pointed a finger, and boof. The orc fell to the ground, fighting desperately to even keep his eyes open. But after a moment of processing what had just happened, that the elf had cast some kind of cheap trick magic on him. Fury ignited inside the orc. A fury that gave him a little bit of a second wind. A number of elven eyebrows raised in shock as Brock started to pick himself up. But some of the elves just went ahead and repeated the finger pointy spell again. And this time, Brock's passed out. Meanwhile again, Lord Xavius was not pleased. Three nights they'd been at this, 
and they had absolutely nothing to show for it. We shall increase the field of power tenfold tomorrow. However, one of the other highborn sorcerers shot the Lord a quick glance. With all due respect, Lord Xavius, that risks much. Such an additional increase may well destabilize all that we've accomplished. And what exactly would that be? What have we accomplished? Why, we command more power than any night elf has ever commanded before. Xavius nodded, and then immediately frowned. Yes, and with it we can squash an insect with a mountain-sized hammer. You are a short-sighted fool. Consider yourself fortunate that we require your skills for this effort. Perithan then bowed his head and shut his goddamn mouth. Good, Xavius thought. Not a complete idiot, then. What we seek to do, we need perfect manipulation of the will to accomplish. We preaching again, my darling Xavius? Xavius narrowed his eyes, dismissed his fellow spellcasters, and then turned to address the one person in this place who did not rightly show him the respect he deserved. Light of the moon, I preach only of your purity, your flawlessness. I simply remind them of their duty, nay, their love, for you. They should not therefore wish to fail, for they would be failing you as well, my darling counsellor. And I think they fear that more than they love me. Hardly, my mistress. Xavius then invited the Queen to observe the project, the thing they'd been working on. And so she and Xavius shifted their gaze towards the glowing circle. It was hypnotic. Xavius had spent long hours staring deep into this creation. Sometimes, if he really squinted, he swore he could see Lord Xavius. I believe you're not listening to me. <clears throat> My apologies, Daughter of the Moon. You were saying, surely we must soon triumph. Surely soon we will have the power to cleanse our land of its imperfection, create the perfect paradise. Indeed, my queen. We are but a short time from the creation of a grand golden age. Your realm will be purified. The world will know everlasting glory, and the blighted impure races will cease to be. The Shara smiled. I'm glad to hear that it will be soon. More petitioners came today, Lord Counselor. They came in fear of the violence in and around the Great Well. They asked me for guidance as to its cause. Naturally, I referred their requests to you. Rightly so, mistress. I will calm their fears long enough for our precious task to come to fruition. After that, it will be your pleasure to announce what has been done for the good of your people. And they shall love me the more for it. If they could possibly love you more than they already do, my glorious queen. Ashara accepted the compliment. I will make the wondrous announcement soon, Lord Xavius. See to it that all is ready when I do. And then she buggered off. And as soon as she left the room, Xavius visibly deflated, with his expression dropping to bitchy resting face. If I am not alerted before the next time our majesty decides to join us, it will be your head. Is that understood? Yes, my lord. I also expect to be notified of Captain Varathin's arrival before the Queen. We need not sully her hands with this task. Make certain that he, and whatever he brings with him, is led directly to me. Yes, my lord. Xavius waved his hand dismissively, and the guard rushed off. And finally, the Lord Counselor was alone. And what better thing to do than turn and stare at the magical energy again? Fascinating. He then took several steps towards it, feeling the intense emanations admiring the sheer potential, drinking in the fantastic sight, when suddenly... I have searched long for you, and now you've come to me. Bound and tossed unceremoniously onto one of the panther saber things, both Ronin and an unconscious Krasis lay silently, bouncing up and down. Ronin did wonder where their captors were taking them, but there wasn't really anything he could do about it at the moment. The Night Elves had placed a small emerald amulet, around his and Krasis' necks, and any time the wizard even tried to think of a spell, he'd immediately feel the sharp pang of a migraine. Ronin had noticed that their captors had grown a little bit more apprehensive since they'd entered this particular stretch of forest. The area felt different, and the Night Elves were no longer carrying themselves as lords of the land. This isn't the path we took. This isn't the way it should be. We followed it back exactly as we should have, my captain. There was no deviation. Look around, Caltharius. What do you see? Because I see nothing but more damned trees. And there's something I don't like about them. 
Somehow, even with our eyes keen and our path understood, we've headed elsewhere. Shall we turn back? Retrace our steps? No, not yet. So, the group pushed forward. But, as they head ever deeper into the thick, towering forest, even Ronin started to feel himself getting slightly concerned. Because he could feel a growing presence, one the likes of which he'd never experienced before. The sun's nearly upon us. Something in the elves' voice suggested that the sun rising would be a bad thing, causing Ronin to speculate that perhaps these beings were weaker during the day. As if them being called night elves wasn't a big giveaway. So all Ronin had to do was rid himself of this damned amulet before the sun rose, and then the odds would surely swing back in his favour. However, as he started to bob his head about like a maniac to try and get the amulet off, he caught sight of something very weird in the bushes. Right, my leather! Ronin blinked for a second, slightly taken aback, but when he opened his eyes, nothing. For a moment, Ronin wondered if he'd just imagined that. Maybe he was just tired and hallucinating bush faces. But the Night Elf captors then suddenly stopped, looking very tense indeed. And then the entire forest erupted into chaos. Oi, oi, who are you? Oi, stab you right in your fucking face. Who are you? Get him off me! Get him off me! A leafy hand suddenly covered Ronin's mouth. He turned his head to see a bush face again and realised more leafy hands had now grabbed his legs. And the next thing he knew, he was being carried off by a whole bunch of little shrub-like dickheads. You're bloody heavy, you are. This is the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. However, the fact that a prisoner was being carried off by the sprite dickheads did not go unnoticed because one elf, the one called Caltharius, raced past on his panther, turned and then immediately started slicing away at the small creatures. But, out of nowhere, huge black birds then dropped from the foliage above and started harassing the night elf. And then, a huge tree branch slammed right into his mount. He won't be getting up from that one, will he? The woodland sprites then continued on as if nothing had just happened like absolute sociopaths, carrying Ronin for several minutes until he could no longer hear any of the screams and chaos that they'd just left behind. At which point, they stopped. One of the leafy creatures then approached Ronin, smiled, and then thrust a small white flower in his face. What's that? I don't want it. But a tiny puff of pollen then shot out of the flower, splattering Ronin's nose and mouth. And then the wizard passed out. A short while later, Krasis awoke to find himself and an unconscious Ronin lying in the midst of some mystical glade. It was an area of immense magic, ancient magic, as old as the dragons. Everything in it radiated peace, which Krasis couldn't help but feel was absolutely intentional. This was the chosen sanctum of some ancient being. I would talk with you. Sure enough, the cloppity clop sound of hooves filled the air, and an extremely imposing ten-foot man moose then approached. I know you. Or, I know of you. And I know something of you, but not nearly as much as I would like. I am Cenarius. This is my realm. Grace has searched his own mind, grasping for knowledge that felt somewhat out of reach. His memory had been pretty hazy since his and Ronin's arrival in this unknown era. He knew Cenarius was a demigod, as powerful as the great aspects. But other than that, you are not well, traveller. Perhaps you should rest more. No, I would speak now, as you'd like. You are more than what you've seen. I see hints of Night Elven, but also sense far, far more. You almost remind me of... No, that's unlikely. He's unlike any creature to be found within or without my domain. We've come a great distance, and we're frankly lost, Great One. We know not where we are. At that, Cenarius just laughed. You must be from far off indeed. Where else could you be, my friend? Where else but Kalimdor? Kalimdor? That didn't really narrow it down much. I suspected as much, my lord. But I sensed an unsettling change in the world. An imbalance. A shifting. I sought out its origin and location in secret. And although I did not find all that I searched for, it did lead me to the two of you. Two wanderers from nowhere. Two lost souls from nothing. You are both enigmas, and that troubles me. Yet you saved us from captivity. Again, the forest lord snort laughed. The night elves grow more arrogant. They take what does not belong to them and trespass where they are not wanted. It is their assumption that everything falls under their domination. Your captors did not quite intrude upon my realm, but I chose to make them do so, in order to teach them a lesson in humility and manners. 
That, and they simply made it simpler for me by bringing what I desired directly here. The elves, they also seem to be aware of our sudden arrival. Zinashari is not without its own abilities. It does, after all, overlook the well itself. The dragon mage eyes then widened. Zin... Zinashari. I, mortal. The capital of the Night Elves' domain. You know not even that. Balls. Even with his fractured memory, Krasis immediately knew what that meant. A very, very long time ago, both Zinashari and the Well of Eternity had been destroyed by complete catastrophe. A catastrophe that ripped the entire world asunder. We will leave as soon as we can, and trouble you no longer. Little one, you misunderstand. You are both puzzle and guest to me. For as long as you remain the former, you will also remain the latter. I believe that you need sustenance. It shall arrive shortly. You should rest until then. Crisis knew better than to decline that offer. If the Forest Lord insists that you stay, then you stay. Looked like he and Ronin were guests for as long as Cenarius desired. Meanwhile, I warn you, my darling counsellor, I adore surprises. But this one I expect to be quite, quite delicious. Xavier smiled as he led the Queen towards the glowy circle. This new revelation might not be quite what the ruler of the Night Elves had had in mind, but the Lord Counselor had no doubt she would not be disappointed. However, it looks no different. Just wait, Light of a Thousand Moons. The Queen frowned and continued to gaze towards the green inferno. It strikes me as unchanged, dear Xavius. I expect- I am coming. With the ritual of the High Moon completed, Tyrande exited the Temple of Elune and sighed deeply. There just wasn't enough Moon Priestess stuff to do to keep her mind occupied from the thing that was troubling her. And that thing was that she knew the relationship between her, Malfurion and Illidan was changing. They were no longer just childhood friends. A competition between the brothers had started and was growing increasingly more intense. And the prize of that competition was her. It was flattering, in a way, if not also slightly insulting. She didn't want to hurt either of them, but in the end, it was her that was going to have to choose. However, as she moved away from the temple, she noted a crowd had gathered, a fairly loud one, pointing and gesturing. So, out of curiosity, she stepped towards it, and then she gasped as she saw a cage holding some strange creature. What is it? No one knows, sister. The Moongard had to spellcast it several times to bring it down. Duranda then studied the beast. It was no dwarf, that was obvious. Probably at least a foot shorter than an elf, though twice as broad. It was clearly strong and clearly angry. But Duranda did not feel disgust or horror towards it. She felt pity. Both the temple and Cenarius had taught her compassion towards living creatures especially living creatures that wore clothing and were therefore likely to have some semblance of intelligence. He needs food and water. I've been given no orders for such, sister. That shouldn't require orders. The sentry raised an eyebrow and shrugged. The elders haven't decided what to do with it yet. Maybe they don't think it'll need any more food or drink, sister. That suggestion repulsed Duranda. Night Elf Justice was so very draconian. If I bring some sustenance for him... Will you attempt to stop me? You really shouldn't, sister. A beast is just as liable to tear your arm off and gnaw on that instead of whatever fare you bring. You'd be wise to leave it alone. I'll take my chances. And so, Duranda walked off and headed directly for the nearest food merchant. She grabbed a jug of water and a bowl of soup and then realized the creature was pretty damn muscly, probably needed a fairly hefty source of protein as well. So she grabbed a chunk of meat the crowd had apparently got bored and dissipated by the time she got back, so that was good. Made things a little easier. As she approached, the creature glanced up at her, mostly eyeing the water, soup and meat she was carrying. He then sat up and Taranda hesitated. She needed to be very careful here, for the creature's sake. Any sudden moves from it and the nearby sentry would no doubt gut it without hesitation. So she slowly knelt down. Do you understand me? The creature grunted and then nodded. I've brought you something. The young priestess then held out the bowl of soup, and the creature's hand very slowly stretched forth, and to Taranda's surprise, very gently took the bowl. So, much more at ease now, Taranda handed over the water and meat. The green-skinned creature then went ahead and scoffed his face. 
Not exactly with the greatest of manners, but Taranda didn't judge. Who knows how long it had been since he'd last eaten. But once it was all finished, the beast wiped its mouth with its arm and then grunted. Good. Bloody hell, said an actual word. Sister, you shouldn't be so near. He'll tell you, he'll do nothing. Taranda then glanced back at the creature. Will you? And the creature just shook its head and did a little chest bump salute thing. Do you want anything else? More food? No. My name is Taranda. I'm a priestess of Alun. For a moment, the figure seemed somewhat not interested in continuing the conversation, but then noted Taranda's determination to wait him out. So? Brox. Broxigar. Sworn servant to the war chief Thrall. Ruler of the Orcs. Well, that was a whole bunch of nonsense, Taranda thought. What's an Orc? And what's a Thrall? Where are you from, Brox? How did you get here? The Orc's eyes then narrowed as he clamped his mouth shut. Stupid, Taranda thought. Of course the Moon Guard had already questioned him. No doubt harshly. Asking that question had just basically made her look like the good cop. Brox then picked up his bowl and held it out towards Taranda, with his expression dark and untrusting. But a sudden flash of energy then coursed into the cage, burning the orc's hand, causing him to snarl and glare with a murderous gaze. Taranda, are you safe? That foul beast didn't hurt you, did he? He had no plans to do me any harm, Illidan. Illidan stepped forward and frowned. I was only fearful for you. The beast is capable of- In there, he's capable of very little. And he is no beast. No, looks like no civilized creature to me. He was merely trying to hand back the bowl, Illidan. I'm sorry, Tyrande. Maybe I overreacted. Though you must admit, few others even among your calling would have taken the terrible risk you did. You might not know this, but they say that when he woke up, he almost throttled one of the moon guard. The young priestess glanced towards the sentry, who reluctantly nodded. Failed to mention that bit, she thought. But still, it made no difference. Brox had been mistreated. I appreciate your concern, Illidan. But again, I tell you that I wasn't in any danger. Duranda then turned back to the cage and reached through the bars to grasp Brox's newly burnt fingers. Duranda, stay back. All of you. He needs healing. I know you didn't mean me any harm. I can mend that for you. Please. Brox growled, but only in a manner that suggested frustration at his lack of options. Duranda then studied the injury. Flesh on two fingers had been burned away, with a third red and festering. What did you do to him? Something I learned recently. It was something Illidan had not learned from Scenarius, that much was certain. This was High Elven sorcery. Obviously, Illidan Stormrage could be quite skilled in subjects that actually excited him, and Taranda was not so certain that she liked the fact that it excited him. Hear me, Mother Moon. Taranda then kissed the orc's fingers gently. Grant me the ability to ease this being's burden, to render whole what has been ruined. Fill me with your purity, your grace. Grant me the power to heal. Moonlight then encompassed the young priestess, startling Brox for a moment. But, to his credit, he continued to trust and allowed his hand to be drawn into the glow. And then, poof, his hand was fine. Thank you, Mother Moon. I honor you, shaman. I'm in your debt. At that, Duranda's cheeks darkened in embarrassment. No idea what a shaman was, but she could sense Brox's gratitude all the same. But as she rose to her feet, she stumbled a little bit and Illidan immediately grabbed her arm to steady her. Are you all right? I'm fine. It's done. Sister, may I have your blessing? Of course. As per the teachings of the temple, blessings of a loon were given freely, so Taranda didn't have much choice in the matter. She went ahead and blessed the sentry. Shaman, may this lowly one too have your blessing. Everybody looked at the orc, shocked, and then looked at Taranda. You need recuperation. You've done enough for this creature. But... Taranda went ahead and ignored Illidan's protest. She was on a blessing streak now anyway. May Illum watch over you and yours. May Aurak's arm be strong. The orc's peculiar response caused her brow to furrow for a second, but she then smiled. Thanks. However, as she rose to her feet once again, an overwhelming force of exhaustion hit her all at once. She needed to go to bed. Forgive me, Illidan. I'm tired. I'd like to return to my sisters now. Well, I'll escort you back. 
There's no need. I'd like to walk alone anyway. Illidan said nothing and simply bowed. And so, after one last smile to the orc, Duranda departed. <sighs> Duranda. Illidan had really wanted to talk to Duranda about his feelings. She needed to know. It was important. He'd waited for hours outside the temple, watching for her appearance, knowing it would be weird if he joined her the moment she stepped out. So he'd hung back in the background for quite a while. Much less weird. Something I'm sure he was convinced was extremely romantic and not creepy at all. But his chance to put Taranda on the spot by confessing his undying love to her had been ruined. Not only that, but he'd been made to look like a villain by this bastard orc. With absolutely zero hesitation, words started to stumble silently out of Illidan's mouth. Loaded magical words. And behind him, the orc in the cage started to scream, roaring in obvious pain. And then, Illidan muttered the counter words, and the prisoner ceased its cries. And with that, the young knight elf smiled to himself and swiftly buggered off. And I guess Brock's passed out or something, because we can't have a chapter where no one does that. No! Brock stirred awake from the same old bloody nightmare he always had. No matter how many times he saw the same nightmare, relived that terrible day where his comrades were slaughtered around him in a desperate stand against the Legion, it never got any easier. If anything, it just got more painful. I'm a coward. I should have fought harder. No one fought harder, my old friend. The scouts saw you battle as they approached. You did your comrades, your people, as good a service as those who perished. Thor's words had been appreciated, but Brock certainly didn't believe them. But the orc then sat up in his cage and took a little look see around. Some one night elven onlookers were staring at him, pointing, marvelling at his ugliness. Arrogant creatures, Brox thought. The lot of them. Except for that one young female that had actually shown him some respect. She was nice. In her, Brox had sensed the power that his own people often talked about. The old ways of magic. She'd healed his wound with nothing but a prayer to the moon. Even honoured him with her blessing. But none of that would matter in the long run. His captors would no doubt soon decide how to execute him. Probably within the next night or so. And it wasn't going to be in a manner of his choosing, not in some glorious battle, and that probably bothered the orc more than anything else. Great spirits, hear this unworthy one. Grant me one last struggle, one last cause. Let me be worthy. Meanwhile, Malfurion had spent three nights sat at home, alone, meditating on all that Scenarius had told him, and that had been an absolute waste of time, so he'd come to Soromar to find some other voice some other mind with which he could discuss his inner dilemma. Specifically, he was looking for Taranda. She was a little bit more level-headed than his twin brother was, and nicer to look at. But, as he neared the Temple of Alun, a bit of commotion caught his attention. A large contingent of riders, and leading them was Lord Catalos Ravencrest. Outside of the Highborn, Ravencrest was considered one of those with the most influence with the Queen. He would be a very good person to talk to about this current predicament. But, now was not a good opportunity to speak with the noble. Looked like he was on his way somewhere important. So, the young knight elf just went ahead and moved on. And soon enough, he entered the temple itself. May we help you, brother? I come seeking the novice priestess, Taranda. She and I are good friends. My name is Malfurion Stormrage. <laughs> Taranda shares chambers with myself and two others. I've seen you with her on occasion. Is it possible to speak with her? If she's finished with her meditation, then she should be free. I'll have someone ask. You may wait in the Chamber of the Moon. All right then. Malfurion made his way to said Chamber of the Moon. And after a period of anxious waiting, Malfurion. For a brief second, all of Malfurion's troubles and concerns vanished. For Taranda was here, and she was brilliant. Are you okay? Has something happened? I'm fine. I hope I haven't intruded. You could never intrude upon me, Malfurion. I'm glad you've come, actually. I wanted to see you too. Both young knight elves' face cheeks darkened. Tyrande, can we take a walk outside the temple? If that makes you more comfortable. You know how I said I've had some recurring dreams? I remember. I spoke with Cenarius about them. 
We took measures to understand why they keep repeating. And did you discover anything? I've progressed, Tyrande. Janaria showed me a path into the mind of the world itself. The Emerald Dream, he called it. But it was more than that. Through it, I was able to see the real world as I never have before. Tyrande paused, and Malfurion noted that she seemed somewhat distracted by a small crowd gathered in a nearby square. And what did you see? I saw Zinashari and the well. Malfurion then went on to describe the unsettling scene he'd experienced, and Tyrande stared wordlessly at him, clearly a little bit stunned, until finally, the Queen. Ashara, can you be certain? Not entirely. I didn't actually see inside. I just can't imagine how such madness could go on without her knowledge. It is true that Lord Xavius has great influence, but she would not stand by blindly. She must know the risks they take. I don't question you, Malfurion, but we need to know more. To claim that Ashara would put her subjects in danger, you have to tread lightly on this. I thought maybe I'd approach Lord Ravencrest on the subject. That might be wise. Again, Tyrande's eyes shifted towards the crowd. So Malfurion himself took a look to try and see what was distracting her so much. And then he saw it. A guarded cage with a creature inside that was not at all like a night elf. What is that? What I wanted to talk to you about, Malfurion. His name is Broxigar, and he's unlike any being I've ever heard or seen. I know your tale is important, but I want you to meet him, as a favour for me. Malfurion nodded, so Tyrande immediately led him towards the cage. Welcome again, sister. What news on him? Lord Ravencrest has assumed control of the situation. He's just head out to search the location of the arrest. See if there's any evidence of further incursions. When he returns, he's going to interrogate the prisoner personally. This time tomorrow, the prisoner will likely be transported to the cells of Blackrock Hold. Malfurion was slightly surprised that this guard was just blurting out this information freely. Something must have happened that made this bloke feel so much at ease around Tyrande. This interrogation, what will it entail? Well, that would be whatever Lord Ravencrest decides, sister. Right. May we speak with him? For a moment, sister. Just... Speak so I can hear you, all right? And so, Tyrande gestured to Malfurion and both knelt down. And immediately, Malfurion bit back a gasp of astonishment. Up close, this really was an amazing creature. Shaman. Proxica, are you okay? I'm fine. Just remembering. I've brought a friend with me. I'd like you to meet him. His name is Malfurion. If he's your friend, Shaman, then I'm honoured. Hello, Broxigar. Broxigar's an orc, Malfurion. I've never heard of an orc before. <laughs> well, I've heard of night elves. You fought beside us against the Legion. But alliances fade in peace, it seems. Malfurion's brow furrowed. This orc's words made no sense. How did you come to be here, Broxigar? The orc then exhaled, stared intently at Tyrande for a moment, and then explained how he'd come to be here. It was a fantastic tale, involving being swallowed by a wobbly distortion. A wrongness, the orc stated. A thing that should not be. And although the tale was ever so slightly hard to believe, Malfurion couldn't help but suspect that there might be some link between whatever the Highborn were up to and whatever the hell this orc was talking about. Malfurion, are you alright? I'm fine. Sister, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you and your companion to depart now. Captain will be back soon. I understand. However, as Tyrande and Malfurion rose to their feet, Shaman, one last blessing, if you could grant it. So, Tyrande went ahead and did that. She then bid farewell to the Orc, and the two young night elves walked off. There must be something we can do. Once he's a Blackrook hold, I have every respect for Lord Ravencrest, but... Malfurion remained silent, only nodding. I spoke with Mother Diana, but... She says there's nothing we can do but pray. Commended my sympathy, but suggested I just let matters take their course. Out of nowhere, Malfurion grasped Tyrande's arm and pulled her into a little alleyway. We need to see Illidan. Illidan? Why? Because we're going to let matters take their course. With our guidance, that is. Meanwhile again... I have heard your pleas and know your dreams. A world cleansed of the impure. I would grant your desire, 
You, the first among my faithful. He will come to us then? He will come to our world and make it so? The way is not yet open. It must be strengthened, for it must be able to withstand my glorious entrance. Xavier's cursed himself. Of course, this poxy little night elf made portal would be far too feeble for a god. However, didn't even cross his mind why this supposed deity couldn't just perform the task himself. What do we do? I will send one of my lesser host to guide you. He may pass through to your world with effort, but you must prepare yourselves for his coming. And so, Xavius leapt to his feet and immediately started barking commands. Let no one stumble in their efforts. We are to be blessed with the presence of one of his favoured. Over the next bloody couple of days or something, <laughs> the Highborn redoubled their efforts, drawing energy directly from the well to strengthen the portal, until finally... It's just a bunch of dogs. Oh! Know that I am the servant of your god. Come to open the way for his host and his glorious self. I am the Houndmaster. I am her car. Ronin opened his eyes, slightly reluctantly, mainly because his dreams had been about Varisa and his soon-to-be-born twins, but also mainly because he didn't particularly want to go through more silly sprite nonsense. Because that was stupid. Warcraft lore should be deadly serious. But instead of a bunch of little sprite dickheads, the first thing Ronin saw was Krasis. Which still kind of pissed him off anyway, because as far as he was concerned, this was all Krasis' fault. Slowly, Ronin. You've slept more than a day. Your body needs a minute or two to join you in waking. Ronin tried to rise, and indeed, felt his body scream from stiffness. Where... where are we? We're guests of the Forest Lord. This is his realm. We're not in any danger, Ronin, but I must tell you immediately that we're unable to depart. Great. What happens if we try to leave? Grace then pointed at a bunch of flowers. They'll stop us. What? The plants? Trust me on this one, Ronin. Fucking try it, you bitch. Warcraft lore should be deadly serious. Ronin's stomach then growled loudly. Our host should be here shortly with sustenance. He no doubt already knows that you're now awake. Who is he? His name is Cenarius. Do you recall it? Ah, uh, rings a bell. Some kind of forest deity, isn't he? A demigod, to be exact. Which still makes him a force that even my kind respect. Right. Cenarius. You speak of me, and I am here. I bid you welcome, one called Ronin. A ten-foot man moose then approached, and Ronin just kind of stared in awe. He slept long, young one. Here, I've brought some food for you. Cenarius then handed over a bowl, the contents of which somewhat surprised Ronin. He expected a bowl of fruit, or lettuce, but this was a big old thick piece of meat. Ah, uh, I have a question. Time for questions will be coming. For now, I'd be remiss if you did not eat. Krasis nudged Ronin and started to eat some of the food. So, the wizard went ahead and tucked in himself. However, he still felt a little bit unsure about the meat. It's not that he didn't want it. He was just a bit surprised that a forest god would sacrifice an animal for two strangers. And Cenarius must have noticed the wizard's hesitance. Each animal, each being, serves many purposes, including the necessity of food. You are like the bear or the wolf, both of whom hunt freely in my domain. Nothing is wasted here. Everything returns to feed new growth. The deer upon which you now feed will be reborn to serve its role again. Its sacrifice forgotten. Ronin frowned, not completely following Cenarius' explanation. Fucking try it, you bitch. The conversation then paused, whilst Krasis and Ronin had their fill, until eventually... I've conversed with the others, discussed you at length, and we all agree that the two of you are not meant to be here. You're out of place. But in what way, we've yet to determine. Perhaps I could explain. Ronin agreed. It probably was best if Krasis was the one to explain the situation. We come from a land across the sea. Far across. But, um, that's unimportant. What is significant is the reason we ended here. Despite choosing to stay silent, 
Ronin was surprised to hear his former mentor blurt out a rather altered version of events. We were journeying among some peaks in the bitter north of our land when we came across an anomaly. The wrongness of it struck us both, so we tried to investigate it further. But it moved and enveloped us. We were cast out of our land and into the domain of the Night Elves. Yes. No mention of Nosdormu, no mention of time travel, and no mention of Krasis' true origins, i.e. the fact he's actually a dragon. This bears immediate discussion with the others. Your needs will be dealt with during my absence, and then we shall speak again. And with that, Scenarius buggered off. What was that? Why didn't you tell him about your- Krasis shot Ronin a sharp glare, as if to say shut up. I'm a dragon without strength, my young friend. No matter who Scenarius is, that needs to remain secret until I understand why I cannot recover. Okay. And the rest of the story? <sighs> Ronin, I mentioned to you that we might be in the past. Yeah? Scenarius and I spoke during your induced slumber. I know now when we are. That's great. Gives us an anchor of sorts. Now we can determine who best to- Let me finish, Ronin. There is a very good reason why I altered our story as much as I could. I suspect there is much that Scenarius already knew, especially about the anomaly. What I could not tell him are my suspicions of what happens next. I fear we've arrived just prior to the first coming of the Burning Legion. That was about the most horrifying thing that Krasis could possibly say, as far as Ronin was concerned. We've got to tell him then. Tell everyone we can. They must not know, Ronin. It may already be too late to preserve matters as they once were. The Legion were defeated, but only after a terrible bloody war. By coming here, by simply being here, we may have altered that history. We may now be responsible for the Burning Legion becoming the victor in this first struggle, which would not only lead to countless innocent slaughter, but the complete erasure of our time. Meanwhile, most likely due to the fact Tyrande had made an impassioned plea rather than anything Malfurion had said, Illidan was now in, on the very rash plan. I'll deal with the sentries. No. I said I'd take care of them. Give me a moment. Malfurion then closed his eyes, calmed himself as Scenarius had shown him, and then made a polite suggestion to the necessary elements of nature. And sure enough, a tender wind started to blow, carrying with it the scent of flowers and the soothing calls of a bird. That seductive combination enveloped the nearby sentry's standing guard, and then they all passed out. It worked. Nice trick, brother. But for how long? I don't know. That's why we must hurry. Duranda moved first, kneeling down beside the cage. I think Broxigal was caught in the spell too, Malfurion. Sure enough, the big old lump of an orc was completely unconscious. <sighs> Rouse him softly, Duranda. Be sure he sees you immediately so you can signal for silence. He's sure to yell. The spell on the guards will hold, Illidan. Just be ready to do your part when the time comes. I'm not the one who'll risk us, brother. Quiet, both of you. Duranda then reached into the cage and gently touched Broxigar's upper arm, whilst softly calling his name. <laughs> no, no. Brox's eyes widened, but, processing what was happening very quickly, he then clamped his mouth shut and nodded. Now, Illidan, hurry. Illidan then got to work, muttering under his breath whilst grabbing the bars of the cage, and then... You can open the cell now, Taranda. So, Taranda touched the door of the cage, and it immediately swung open. The chains, Illidan. Of course, brother. I've not forgotten. Again, Illidan muttered some words, and this time grabbed the chain shackling the orc, and after a few seconds, the chain snapped open. No trouble whatsoever. Proxigar then stiffly rose to his feet and exited the cage, very cautiously nodding his gratitude to the night elf that had assaulted him only a few chapters ago. Proxigar, listen carefully. I want you to go with Malfurion. It will take you to a safe place. I'll join you later. That part of the plan had been Malfurion's idea, which Taranda had somewhat argued with. But, to be fair, once the moon guard discovered that Proxigar is no longer in his cell, the young priestess was likely to be a primary suspect. Brox then studied Malfurion for a moment, before glaring at Illidan. I just saved your hide, beast. Enough, Illidan. Just Malfurion. He'll take you to a place where no one will be able to find you. Please, trust me. I do trust you, Shaman. One of the guards on the floor then twitched. It's starting to wear off. Illidan, 
Take Tyrande and leave. Brox, come on. And then the group split up, with Tyrande and Illidan heading towards his quarters, whilst Marfurion and Brox attempted to escape the city entirely. However, they only made it a few streets away before a sound that Malfurion had feared most arose. This way! I've mounts waiting for us! We ride these? Of course! Come on! Brox didn't look overjoyed about climbing on the back of a big panther, but it's not like they had much choice. So he took a deep breath, did as he was told, and the two buggered off. Meanwhile again, Captain Varathen had very little desire to face Lord Xavius after what had happened, but he kind of had to. However, that concern completely vanished as he entered the highborn chamber and witnessed some kind of nightmarish beast. By a loon! His name is Hakar. Those fell beasts are entirely under his control. The Great One sent him to help us. The Great One, my lord. It's all right, my good captain. Nothing to fear. My lord Xavius, the captives were lost. The forest turned against us. To Varathen's surprise, the Lord Counselor simply smiled. You will be given the opportunity to redeem yourself in good time, Captain. First, you must understand the glorious truth. My lord, I don't- Varathen didn't get to finish that sentence, because a sudden overwhelming sense of a god hit him. You too will serve me well. He will be coming to us soon, Captain. He sent this noble guardian to open the path for others of his host. Others who will in turn help us strengthen the Vortex and bring about the fruition of all of our dreams. My lord, my failure to capture those strangers. Your failure is moot. They will be taken. The Great One is most interested in this matter. The car then cracked his whip at an empty area near him, and out of nowhere, a fell beast appeared. He then cracked his whip again, and another fell beast appeared. Ah, oh, I get it. He's got one of them fell beast whips, yeah. They know what they seek, and they will find them. Now, we shall begin our own task. After another entire day of just mooching about in Cenarius' realm, Kratos realized that they were being watched. It took him a further 12 hours to realize that this observer had nothing to do with Cenarius. Through the process of elimination, the Dragon Mage pieced together who or what this secretive watcher could actually be. It was one of his own kind, a dragon. It wasn't uncommon for dragons to send out observers. All races have their spies, but dragons also had a tendency to not get involved unless a threat was absolutely imminent, which in this particular situation would be leaving it too late. Kratos thought. He was going to need to force the issue. So, after waiting for Ronin to nod off, which is another form of passing out, Kratos rose, carefully shielded his own thoughts, and stared directly towards a nearby tree. I know you. I know what you are, Watcher. However, nothing. No reply. I know you. Clugged is part of the tree. You watch us. And the Forest Lord. You wonder who we are and why we're here. This time, Crisis felt a presence stir, only slightly. The observer was uncomfortable. Good. As much I can tell you, things I could not tell to the Lord of the Forest, but I would speak with more than just the trunk of a tree. You risk us both. The demigod could be watching us. You know as well as I do that he's not here. Again, silence, and a brief pause, until finally... Who are you? A kindred spirit, you might say. <laughs> you do not know at all what you suggest. I know exactly what I suggest. I know it as well as I do that she who is called Alex Straza is the Queen of Life. He who is called Nosdorma is time itself. Ysira is she of the dreaming. And Malagos is magic incarnate. The mysterious figure hesitated for a moment. You do not mention one. And Naltharian is the earth and rock itself water of the land. Such names are known by few outside my kind, but they are known by a few. But what name might I know you, that I should think you kindred? I am known as Coriolstras. Again, the mysterious figure hesitated. I could not fail to know that name. Not when it belongs to a consort of the Queen of Life. But something is amiss. I've observed everything since your capture. You are like none of my kind. Cenarius is powerful, 
Very much so. But he should not so readily hold the one called Cory Elstras as his hostage. I've been injured badly. I must reach Alex Straza and tell her what I know. Can you take me to her? Just like that? <laughs> you certainly have the arrogance of a dragon. Why should I risk for all dragons the umbrage of the woodland deity on your questionable identity alone? Because the potential threat to our world is more important than the dignity of a demigod. If you permit it, I will reveal to you what I mean. The mysterious figure considered this for a moment. I don't trust you. But in your condition, I don't think I have much to fear from you either. Show me what colours your words with such anxiety, if you know how. So, Gracious reached out with his mind and touched the strangers, linking them both. And then, the Dragon Mage unveiled the truth. All of it, causing the other dragon to stumble back under the rush of intense images. Impossible. Probable, I would say. Those were pure figments of your creation. Would that they were... You see now why I must speak with our queen. What you're asking is... However, both dragons then froze, sensing an overwhelming force approaching. Scenarius. Balls. The Watcher began to retreat. You cannot afford to ignore this. I must see Alexstrasza. The flowers beneath Krasis' feet then started to spew out strange dust, and the Dragon Mage's brain started to feel very foggy. But strong arms then caught him before he could fall on his face. I'm a fool for doing this. And then, Krasis passed out. Meanwhile, Boxigar and Malfurion darted through the forest to top their panthers. They've not been given a single chance to stop since the last chapter because they had a whole bunch of night elves hot on their heels. And just to make things more annoying, Roxigar then completely lost sight of Malfurion because the bloke disappeared into a murky fog. And before Brox could even yell out for a bit of direction, his own panther then shifted suddenly to avoid running directly into a massive rock. He landed with a thud and cursed loudly, but there was no time to moan. His pursuers were already nearly upon him. So he picked himself up and got into his fighty stance. However, instead of a bunch of night elves bursting through the bushes, a panting four-legged monster jumped out. <laughs> the beast stumbled and howled, whilst Brox just glared at it and maintained eye contact the entire time. However, Brox's panther mount then reappeared, charging in and colliding with the beast. Now, the panther probably wasn't going to win that fight, but Brox didn't give a shit. He started to back away, turned, and then found himself face to face with a second fell beast. Oh, for fuck's sake. Brox then started to cheese it, running as fast as he could through the forest with the demon snapping at his heels. And after a bit of that, the mournful whelp of a dying panther filled the air. Great, Brox thought. Soon there will be two fell beasts snapping at my heels. And unfortunately, that slight distraction caused Brox to stop looking where he was going, so he tripped over a tree branch and fell on his face. But, as the fell beast that had been chasing him pounced, he quickly grabbed a stick, but he stabbed the twat. The other fell beast with the broken nose then approached, snarling and salivating, and again Brox glared deep into the creature's eyes, when suddenly, vines and roots and stuff burst from the forest floor and ensnared the beast. Brox! Malfurion then arrived, hoisting Brox up onto the back of his mount. Thanks. I owe you again. You owe me nothing. That trap won't hold the beast for long. Sure enough, the fell beast's tentacles whipped against the grass and weeds around it, and within moments, it was free. However, a very loud sound of a horn then filled the air, but that just made Malfurion feel worse. You'll ride directly into that beast. If you wish to stay and fight the creature with them, I'll stand at your side. Both the druid and the orc knew that doing so would mean Brox's death or recapture. So, with a heavy heart, Malfurion urged his mount forward, away from both Fellbeast and the approaching night elves. Meanwhile again, Ronan awoke, feeling very uneasy. He sat up and very quickly realised that his companion was nowhere to be seen. Where is the other one? Where is your friend? I don't bloody know. I just woke up. Cenarius frowned, making Ronin feel even more very uneasy. There are troubling signs in the world. Some of the others have sensed intruders. Creatures, not of any natural origin sniffing around. Seeking something. Or someone. And they come so soon after you and your friend drop from nowhere. Ronin suspected what these unknown creatures might be, and if those suspicions were correct, then that meant they had even less time than they realised. 
Your friend could not have escaped without assistance, but he leaves you behind. Why is that? I... There were those among the others that insisted I should have given you to them immediately. They believe we should have used more thorough means to find out the reasons for your being here. Up until now, I'd convinced them otherwise. Ronin's attuned senses then detected the presence of another powerful force behind him. However, his entire body was now not obeying his commands to turn around and look. You admit you were wrong, then? I admit only that other steps must be taken. Very well. The truth will be known, and known soon. You should stay in the temple, Tyrande. Mafurian thought that best, and so do I. I have to know what's happening. You saw how many rode in pursuit. If they captured them, they won't. Illidan squinted. The sun was blinding, and he didn't like it at all. He felt weaker. It was annoying, and Tyrande was being annoying and all. I should ride after. You do that, and you'll risk everyone. You want them to take that pet creature of yours to Black Rockhold? Hell, they may even take us as well. Illidan suddenly shut his mouth, because at the opposite end of the square, several armoured riders appeared, led by none other than Lord Catalos Ravencrest, who was now headed directly towards them. I know you, lad. Illidan Storm Rage, isn't it? Yes, my lord. We've... we've met. And this? Surrender Whisperwind, novice priestess of the Temple of Elune. Ravencrest graciously acknowledged Tyrande, and then returned his gaze back to Illidan again. I recall our encounter. He was studying the arts, then. You're not yet a member of the Moon Guard, are you? No, my lord. Then you're free of some of their restrictions. By restrictions, the commander was referring to the oath the members of the Moon Guard swear. They owed no loyalty to anyone but the Queen. Very good. I want you to ride with us, then. Both Illidan and Tyrande looked at each other for a moment, slightly confused. My Lord Ravencrest, we would be honoured. Not you, sister. It is the lad alone with whom I speak now. Trying not to show his increasing anxiety, Illidan then piped up. What would you have need of me for, my Lord? For the moment, investigation into the escape of the creature we had penned here. I have some notion as to how to find him. I may need the aid of a bit of sorcery. The Moonguard are capable, but I prefer someone who listens to orders. Illidan knew that to refuse Ravencrest would be ever so slightly suspicious, but to join him would risk Malfurion. Deep down, the young sorcerer kind of wished Tyrande could tell him what the bloody hell he was supposed to do, but there was really only one choice. I'd be honoured, my lord. Excellent. Rotharak, a mount for our young sorcerer friend here. The officer in question immediately approached with a spare nightsaber, almost as if this entire encounter had been a foregone conclusion from the start. The sun is well upon us, my lord. We'll make do. A short while later, Illidan, Ravencrest and the rest were making their way through the foggy forest. Seeing the thick mist had made Illidan feel slightly better, meant more hope for his brother. Out of nowhere, Ravencrest suddenly slowed his mount with the rest following suit. Up ahead, there seemed to be a number of peculiar mounds scattered along the trail. Ominous mounds. The night elves then cautiously approached. By the blessed Ashara's eyes. Illidan stayed silent, gaping at the half dozen dead night elves lying before them. Their bodies were absolutely torn to shreds, and some of them looked almost sucked dry by some kind of vampiric force. They looked like raisins. That green-skinned creature was not alone. It must have been two dozen or more to do something like this. Again, Illidan remained silent, more concerned about what might have happened to Malfurion. This couldn't be the work of his brother. So was Ravencrest right? Had Brox betrayed Malfurion and led him to his savage comrades? Illidan's fist then tightened. Should have slain the beast when he had the opportunity, he thought. My lord, come look at this. Both Illidan and Ravencrest obliged, following the panicked officer, and soon found themselves staring wide-eyed at yet another horrific sight. "'Twas a creature of nightmare, stabbed with a stick. "'What do you make of it, sorcerer? "'I have no idea, Lord Ravencrest. "'No idea.' "'Again, Illidan's thoughts turned to his brother. "'Had Malfurion stabbed this monster? "'Seemed unlikely. "'He was gifted in druid stuff, but very curious. "'Where are the rest of the first party? "'There should be twice as many as we found.' "'Very conveniently, a mournful horn blast then arose from the south.' 
and the commander immediately pointed in that direction. That way. But be wary. There may be more of these monsters about. The party then made their way south, coming across a dead panther, with its entire side ripped open and organs hanging out. And the commander noted that a lot of his men now looked extremely terrified. Steady. Keep order. The horn then sounded again, this time rather feebly, but it was definitely much closer. And by much closer, it was definitely directly ahead. As the group moved closer, Illidan had the horrible feeling that something was watching them. Or more specifically, watching him. Another one, my lord! Sure enough, a second hellish beast lay dead before them. This one with a broken nose, as well as several strange rope-like marks on its legs. What had killed it, however, were several stabs to its throat by night elven blades. <coughs> Illidan and Ravencrest head towards that weird noise to find a night elf propped up against a tree. He wasn't looking so good, because half his face was torn off. Are there any more survivors? The mauled night elf opened his mouth, but no words came out, only disgusting gurgling sounds. Rotharak, see to his wounds. Give him water. Aye, my lord. The rest of you, fan out. Now. Illidan remained with Ravencrest, whilst the others tried to establish what they hoped would be a safe perimeter. You could feel the tension in the air, though. So many of their fellows, including three spellcasters, had been massacred. So morale was a bit shit. Who was responsible for this? The escaped prisoner? This time, the half a face night elf actually did manage some words. Never saw that one, my lord. So it was those monsters then? Yes. The wounded soldier then regaled the story. The soldiers and the moon guard had pursued the escaped orc and another unidentified figure through the forest. But they then came across a nightmarish beast, stabbed with a stick. The lead sorcerer Hargathen tried to take a closer look at the dead creature, but a second monster jumped out of the bushes. Its tentacles latched onto the sorcerer, and the other night elves watched in horror as his entire body shriveled dry and he looked like a raisin. And after finishing with Hargathen, the beast seemed to go on and target two more spellcasters and do exactly the same thing. However, the soldiers recovered from their shock and charged the beast, stabbing it in the throat as many times as they possibly could. Unfortunately, they realised a little bit too late that there was in fact a third monster. And at that point in the story, the half a face soldier passed out. See what you can do for him, to ease his pain. I want to take another look at that first carcass. Illidan, with me. So, Illidan and Ravencrest head back up the trail, whilst the others continued to survey the area. What did you make of the story? Have you heard of such things? Never, my lord. But then I'm not part of the Moonguard. I'm not privy to their arcane knowledge. For all the good their knowledge did them. Hargathen was always too confident. Most of the Moonguard are. Ravencrest then knelt down and studied the dead beast. In all my years, I've never seen a thing so well designed for carnage. The commander then lifted a leathery tentacle. Curious appendage. What do you make of it? Based on the story, it's vampiric in nature, my lord. It seemed to target the spellcasters, so I'd hazard a guess that it leeches magical energy. The other thing Illidan noted from the story, but did not say out loud, was that this first beast was dead upon arrival, meaning the only ones that could have slain it were Malfurion and Brox. And there was one more thing about the story that had been bothering Illidan. By his count, they'd seen this dead beast, they'd seen the second dead beast, but... My lord, we never found any sign of the third... Illidan couldn't finish that sentence, because the third fell beast had perfect dramatic timing. The canine horror immediately lashed at Illidan with his tentacles, but the young sorcerer dived out of the way, and with very quick thinking, cast a spell. But not directly at the creature, the thing would no doubt just absorb the magic or something. Instead, Illidan cast his spell at Ravencrust's blade. That was incredible, Illidan. My lord. Rolthorak then came a-running, and immediately saw the dead fell beast with Ravencrest's blade stuck in its back. You killed one, my lord. Are you injured? It was not me. Here stands the one that readily disposed of this creature. I saw right about you from the first, Illidan Stormrage. You're more capable than a dozen Moongart. Illidan's face cheeks darkened, but he accepted the praise. That was pretty incredible, what he just did. This, sorcery, 
This was his destiny. Malfurion's path was never meant to be his. Illidan Stormrage, the Moonguard may be ignorant of your prowess, but I am not. You are hereby marked as one of Blackbrook Hall's own. My personal sorcerer. I'm honoured, my lord. Come, we ride back immediately. I want to gather a larger force to bring those carcasses back to the hold. If we're to be invaded by some hellish horde, we must learn everything we can. He's strong of mind, strong of soul, and strong of body. An admirable quality, at other times. The truth will be known. I've never failed to make it so. Ronin wasn't entirely sure where he was, or what was happening. Felt like he was floating, between sleep and waking. Felt bloody weird. No more. He's been through enough. Return him to me. <laughs> You're resilient, Ronin Wizard. You surprised one who's usually little surprised. And more to the point, you held your secrets. However foolish that may be. There's nothing I can tell you. That remains to be seen. We will know what happened to your companion. And why you, who should not be here, are... But for now, you should rest. That much you deserve. Cenarius then waved a hand over Ronin's face, and the wizard passed out. Meanwhile, Krasus also had no idea where he was. Twas a cavern, but one he did not recognize at all, thanks to his absolute bonk memory. But what bothered him the most was that he could not sense the presence of any other creature here, not even one of his own kind. Krasus then looked around, and realized there was no visible exit to this place. Balls. I do not have time for these games. I do not have time for these games. I do not have time for these games. <laughs> Crisis then sighed in frustration before collecting his thoughts. He was obviously missing something. Surely he'd been brought to this place for a reason, but what? And then a smile formed on the dragon mage's face as he recalled a certain ritual that his own kind used on occasion. So, the mage turned in a circle three times, whilst reciting a ritual greeting in a language older than the world itself, emphasizing the correct parts of the sentence, as only one who had learned it from the very source of that language could. Speaks the tongue of those who brought us into being. It must be one of us then, for it surely cannot be one of them. All must be known. Suddenly, as if by magic, several red dragons appeared, staring at Krasis as if he was some small but tasty morsel of food. But, Krasis just stood there and stared back. Definitely one of us. That's why I brought him. That and his incessant whining. If you had the sense the creators gave you, you would have known me for what I am and the urgency of my message immediately. See? Incessant whining. <sighs> Where are we? If you truly are one of us, little dragon, then you should know this place as well as you know your nest. Krasis cursed his addled memory under his breath, but then used his brain to try and figure it out anyway. Is it... the home caverns? The realm of beloved Alexstrasza? You did want to come here. The question remains, does he go any further? He goes as far as he desires, if he can answer me a simple question. Another male dragon then approached, this one significantly larger than the others, if you are one of us, you must know who I am. Again, the mage struggled with his tattered memories and concentrated really hard. Tyrannistras. Tyran, the scholarly one. Consort to Alexstrasza. You are indeed one of us then, although I cannot place you. I've been given a name for you by the one who brought you, but clearly it's wrong. Among us, a name is given to one and only one. There is no mistake. And I can explain why. The explanation you've given has been relayed to us. And it's found too astonishing to be true. What you say falls into the realm of the Timeless One, Nosdormu. But even he would not be as careless as to do as you have shown. He's adult, plain and simple, perhaps. But he did answer my question. You are of the flight, and therefore have the right to enter this lair. Come. I'll take you to the one who will settle this matter for us all. The one who knows all her flight. She'll recognize you, and therefore recognize the truth. You'll take me to Alexstrasza. None other. Come on. So, Tyrannahaz... Tyrannahath? Tyrann... Tyrannastras went ahead and did just that. 
leading Crasis through a bunch of tunnels that weren't there a second ago until finally, with your permission, my love, always for you. Crasis felt a twinge of jealousy for a moment before getting over it. The Queen of Life was jam-packed full of love. Plenty of it to go around. My Queen. Alexstrasza somewhat acknowledged Crasis before returning her gaze back to Tehran. Would you leave us alone for a time? So, wordlessly, the big old behemoth backed out of the chamber, and then there was awkward silence. Crasis waited for some sign of recognition, but received none. My queen, can it be that you of all beings do not know me? Again, Alexstrasza studied him. I know what I sense, and I know what I feel. And because of that, I have taken the story you have told the others under serious consideration. I have already decided what must be done. But first, there is another who must be involved in this situation. One whose august opinion is as dear to me as my own. From a nearby passage, yet another male dragon emerged, moving slowly as if each step was a heavy labour. But it wasn't that the dragon was old. They appeared to be afflicted by some unknown malady. You summoned me, my Alexstrasza. I asked for your presence here, yes. Forgive me if the effort strains you too much. There is nothing I would not do for you, my love. The Dragon Queen then gestured towards the mage, who now looked as if he'd been struck by lightning. This is... what do you call yourself? Cor... Krasis, my queen. Krasis? <laughs> there was a hint of amusement in Alex Strauss's voice. And this, Krasis, is one of my most beloved subjects. My most recent consort, one whom I already greatly look for guidance. Being one of us, you may have heard of him before. His name is Corielstras. Meanwhile again, Malfurion and Brox arrived at their destination, with a tense silence hanging in the air. We're here. In a few moments, the oak should be in sight. However, despite being near his goal, Malfurion felt bloody awful. His life had forever changed. If the Moon Guard found out about this, he'd be shunned. Literally. No Night Elf, not even Tyrande or Illidan, would ever be allowed to interact with him ever again. And on top of that, Malfurion felt guilt for leaving the Hunters to face that demonic creature. Just as he said though, an oak tree then suddenly appeared ahead of them. Brox, I must ask a favour of you. I owe you much. Ask it. Go to that tree. Touch the palm of your hand to the trunk. So, slightly confused, Brox walked over to the tree and did what he was told. What do I do now? Nothing. Simply stand there. It's learning of you. Your hand will tingle, but that's all. What Malfurion did not mention was that tingling sensation was actually the result of tiny root tendrils now penetrating the orc's flesh. The oak was learning of Brox by briefly becoming a part of him. But Brox stood there, his eyes fixed on his palm, patiently waiting. Until finally, it's done. The way is open to us now. Malfurion then led the orc forward, past the oak, and into a serene glade. However, both of them looked ever so slightly surprised at the figure, just kind of sitting around in the middle of it. You shouldn't be here. I come with him, wizard, and need no permission of yours. Ronin then stood up and shook his head at the misunderstanding. No, I mean this isn't your time. You shouldn't exist here at all. Ronin then raised a hand which Malfurion didn't like, looked like some kind of threat. So, the druid prepared a spell of his own. There will be none of that in my sanctum. And then, Cenarius arrived. Of you, young night elf, I expect better. But these are strange times. Cenarius then eyed Brox. I'm growing stranger with each passing hour, it seems. Brox growled, defiantly, but Malfurion went ahead and nudged him. This is the Lord of the Forest. The demigod Cenarius, the one to whom I said I would bring you, Brox. And that one? Is he another demigod? He's part of a puzzle. You look to be another piece of the same one. You recognize this newcomer, friend Ronin? The wizard remained silent, causing Cenarius to shake his head in disappointment. I mean you no harm, Ronin. But too much has come about that I and the others find disturbing. You, your companion, and now this one. His name is Brox, this one named Brox, another being the likes of which I have never seen. How does Brox come to be here, my student? 
I suspect there's a tale to tell. And so, Alfurion went ahead and regaled the story of the last several chapters. However, in his version, all blame lay at his feet. He barely mentioned Illidan and Tyrande at all. But, Cenarius saw right through that anyway. I said that the destinies of your brother and you would take different roads. I believe that fork has now come, whether you know it or not. I do not understand. It's a talk for another time. Time we do not have at the moment. Cenarius was now staring into the forest, slightly distracted. You'd better prepare yourselves. You included, friend Ronin. Me? What is it, Shando? We're about to be attacked, and I fear that even I may not be able to protect all of you. Xavius blinked his artificial ruby eyes at the fiery portal, feeling really pleased with himself. He was the Great One's most favoured. Once the way was opened, he would surely receive ultimate power. But the Highborn were still failing to open the way, which was bloody annoying. Not just to Xavius, but to two others as well. Firstly, Queen Ashara. She was getting very impatient for the dawn of her perfect paradise, a world where only night elves existed. The best race, in her opinion. She probably wouldn't be in such a rush though, if she knew that Xavius planned to take her as his consort, once all was said and done. And the other angry, frustrated person was Hakar the Houndmaster. He was now pacing beside the highborn sorcerers, critiquing their work and giving them the odd slap here and there. And thanks to that helpful assistance, the highborn managed to bring forth a whopping four new members of the Great One's host, Felguards. The Great One fulfills his promise to you, Lord Night Elf. Command them. They are yours to do as you please. And Xavius knew exactly what to do with them. They will best serve as a gift for the Queen. I shall make them honoured bodyguards for Ashara. And so, Xavius buggered off to get right on that. Mistress, forgive this humble one, but the Lord Counselor requests an audience with yourself. He's brought something of interest to you. The Queen pursed her lips and pondered for a moment. Make him wait five minutes, then grant him entrance. So, the attendant turned and exited the chamber, and exactly five minutes later, Lord Xavius entered. My darling Lord Counselor, you must have something of vital importance to say to me, to request an audience at such an hour. Lord Xavius then took a knee. Light of lights, cherished heart of the people, I am grateful for this time given me. I apologize for disturbing you, but I've brought with me a most interesting gift. A gift truly worthy of the Queen of the Night Elves, the Queen of the World. May I summon it? Xavius glanced up and noted that the Queen's interest was well and truly piqued. Good. I grant you the honor of presenting me with your gift. Xavius then rose, turned to the doors and snapped his fingers, and four Felguards then marched into the sanctum causing Ashara to lean forward, utterly fascinated. What are they? They are yours, my queen. The protection of your life is their duty, their only reason to exist. Behold your majesty, your new bodyguards. How wonderful. How very fitting. Your gift is acceptable. I'm pleased that you were pleased. The queen stepped towards the towering figures and inspected each of them. Are there more? There will be, eventually. <sighs> so few, after so long. How would the Great One himself come through if we cannot manage more than a few of his hosts at a time? We draw from the well as best we can, O oh glorious queen. But there are contradictory currents, influence of other spellcasters elsewhere. Ashara gently brushed her hand over one of the Felguard's pecks, to which the creature hissed slightly. But that reaction only seemed to amuse the Queen. Then why haven't you cut off the well from these outside influences? It would make your task much simpler. Xavius opened his mouth to explain why it wasn't that simple before realizing that actually, it was. Truly you are the Queen. Of course I am, darling Counselor. There's only ever been, only ever will be, one Ashara. Now, is there anything else? Nothing for now, my queen. Well then, I think you must have more work to do. 
Xavier's bowed and then buggered off. He wasn't pissed off at her regal tone or shitty attitude, mainly because of her suggestion. Cut off the well from interference. It was certainly doable, with use of the well limited to only those within the palace. The power within would be more easily manipulated. It would cause absolute havoc to the rest of the Night Elf people, but big whoops. Meanwhile, he is definitely one of us. Somehow I know this as well as I know myself. Crasis stared at the floor, thinking about how ironic those words were. What else do you say about him? He's old. Very old. Something in his eyes. His eyes. What about them? The young dragon jerked back a bit. Forgive me. My head is addled. I'm not worthy of being in your presence at this time. However, Alex Strauza wasn't going to accept that. Look at him, my mate. I ask you this one last thing. With what little you know, would you trust the word of this one? I... Yes, my Alex Strauza. I would. Suddenly, a curious thing happened to Krasus. Whilst the two dragons conversed about him as if he wasn't in the room, he could feel a sense of strength building inside him. Not quite a full return to normal, but closer. And at the same time, his younger dragon self was also displaying signs of being healthier. He was standing taller now, with a bit of colour returning to his scales. So I wanted to hear. Is there anything else you wish of me? My strength is better, being with you. Being of assistance to you has heartened me. Always the poetic one, my loving Coriel Strauss. Yes, I wish much more of you. I know it will be difficult, but I must ask your presence when I bring this one before the other aspects. That statement shocked both versions of Krasis, but the younger incarnation spoke first. You would convene a gathering of the five over this one. Why? Because he's told a story that they must hear. When I tell you now, and you may answer again afterward as to whether you trust him or not. Finally, Crisis thought, his earlier self would learn the truth. But, just as he had startled Ronin a few chapters ago by leaving out crucial parts of their story to Cenarius, Alex Straza now did exactly the same thing, leaving out the mage's true identity entirely. However, this was Alex Straza, his love, his life. So, Crisis went ahead and stayed quiet. An astonishing tale. I would have trouble believing it from any mouth but your own, my queen. Has your trust in him faded? No. If you think he should be brought before the others, then so be it. Will you fly with me then? But I'm not one of the five. I'm merely me. <laughs> and thus you are as worthy as any of us. If I am as strong as I now feel, I will gladly fly at your side. Thank you. That is all I ask. The two dragons then nuzzled heads for a moment, whilst Krasis felt another, somewhat peculiar twinge of jealousy. Obviously, Alex Straza was in a number of open relationships, but being cucked by yourself hit differently. It was weird. But Coriel Strauss then buggered off, and as soon as he was gone, Krasis felt lightheaded and weak again. The two parts made whole, at least for a time. I don't un- You felt much better in his presence, did you not? Yes. Would I Nos Dormu at this moment? You would understand this more. But, I think, in the earthly realm, no creature can coexist with himself. I believe you and he, being one, draw off the same life force. When you are far from each other, you are halved. But together, the draining is not so terrible. You help each other. So that's why you requested him to come with. Your story must be told, and it will be told better if he is near. As to your unspoken question, why I did not reveal the truth to him, that is because of what may have to be done to salvage matters. Alex Straza's tone grew grim, confirming a suspicion that Krasis had had since he'd first realised he and Ronin had been displaced. You think it may come to a point where I must be removed, even if it means death? I'm afraid so, my love. I accept the choice. I knew it from the beginning. Then there's only one more matter to discuss. The other who came with you. In his head, Krasis asked Ronin to forgive him, but did not hesitate at all. If it must be done, he will share my fate. He too has those he cares about. He would give his life for them. The Queen of Life then nodded. I trust your counsel. Should the other decide so, he will also be removed. 
Just know that I will be saddened by this forever. Take no blame unto yourself, my queen. I will go contact the others. It would be best for you if you wait for me here. In this place you'll find yourself not so weary. Alexstrasza gestured, and Gracious went ahead and took a seat in a very comfy part of his queen's nest. And the Dragon Queen then moved to leave. But she paused. I hope you'll be comfortable among the eggs. I'll be careful not to touch any. I'm certain you will, my love. Especially knowing that they are yours. And then the Dragon Queen buggered off. And Crisis kind of just stared at all the eggs around him. He wasn't shocked. He had, of course, already experienced the birth of his children. Many of them having already grown to adulthood in his time. But he still felt proud all the same. However, he was also a little bit sad and conflicted. Deep down, he knew it was right to not tell Alexstrasza about the future. Not just about the imminent invasion from the Burning Legion, but also what happens to her in 10,000 years time. The fact that she becomes a slave, and their children the war dogs of a conquering race. But right or not, he still felt like an absolute shit husband. The hounds of which you spoke, they followed you here. Followed? Impossible. There was only one left, and it- However, Brox then interrupted Malfurion's bumblings. Fell beasts. The dark magic. Where there was one, there can be more, if they're able to feed. Brox then instinctively reached for a war axe that he didn't have. I've nothing to fight with. You'll be armed. You'll find many branches lying around. Find one the length of your favoured weapon. Malfurion, attend to me. Brox went ahead and did as he was told. Now, as a little aside, Ronin had been quietly struggling with some internal strife. Crisis had made it quite clear that the two of them should not interact too much with the past. To best preserve the lives of those he loved, the wizard really shouldn't do or say anything. So that was his plan. But anyway. Kneel before it, my student. You too, warrior. Malfurion, place your hands upon the branch. Brox, place your palms atop his hands. Now, clear your mind, warrior, of all but the weapon. I will guide you more when that is done. Both Malfurion and Brox did those things, placing their hands atop each other. This is gay. Shh. Keep rubbing the shaft. Immediately, a primal force bullied its way into Malfurion's mind. But, after collecting himself, the young night elf accepted Brox's thoughts and let the image of what the warrior wanted take shape in his mind. Can you see the weapon, my student? Sense the feel of it. I do. As well as seeing the weapon, Malfurion could also feel the orc's relationship to it. It was more than just a simple tool. It was a true extension of a warrior. Guide your hands over the wood. Follow the natural grain and turn it into the shape desired. So, the night elf, with big old chunky orc hands atop his own, ran his fingers along the branch, feeling the wood shift. And then, boof, the branch was a war axe all of a sudden or something. The task is done. Return to us. Malfurion and Brox then opened their eyes, awkwardly avoiding eye contact with each other, while Scenarius studied the newly formed weapon. Let it always swing true. Always protect its master. Let it be wielded well for the cause of life and justice. As the Forest Lord spoke, the axe started to glow, and then... It's yours. It will serve you well. So the Orc accepted the gift, swinging it back and forth a few times just to test the quality. It's... The balance is perfect, like a part of my arm. But it's made of wood. It's gonna crack. No. In addition to Malfurion's work, it has my blessing. You'll find it stronger than any mortal forged axe. You can trust me on that. The first fell beast then pounced into shot, and Cenarius stepped forward, unleashing what can only be described as a miniature sun. However, instead of striking it dead, the beast absorbed it. It then shivered a little bit in arousal, and then immediately split into two fell beasts. Those two fell beasts then charged the Forest Lord, whilst two more arrived and rushed towards Brox. And still, Ronin just stood there. What could he do anyway? Magic obviously wasn't going to help. He had sword skills, yes, but no sword. And it was probably a bit too late to ask Scenarius for a weapon now. Brox let out a huge war cry that actually managed to startle one of the fell beasts, And the orc jumped on that hesitation, swinging his new axe, which cut deep into the beast's flesh. Meanwhile, Malfurion unleashed a violent typhoon, 
blasting his target, knocking it back and reducing its movement speed by 50% for 6 seconds or something. He then asked the surrounding trees for the gift of whatever spare leaves they had to offer, and within moments, hundreds descended from above, pouring into the whirlwind. That combination acted as a sort of nature blender, cutting and slashing the fell beast into nothing but a green, glowy paste of goo. And again, Ronin just kind of stood there. Everyone else seems to have this pretty much covered, he thought. But, as the wizard observed Brox, a pretty shit thought popped into his head. Ronin had figured out that if he and Crisis could not be returned to their time, they'd most likely have to die, to ensure that time wasn't completely buggered. But neither of them had counted on a single orc warrior also being thrown into this era. An orc warrior that was very much interacting with the past, and playing very fast and loose with it. So, Ronin was now contemplating the fact that he needed to deal with that orc warrior, quickly. Perhaps in the midst of this chaos, no one would notice if the orc suddenly dropped dead from a magic spell to his back. But, Ronin then shook his head, pushing back that shitty thought and realising he was being a dick. And finally, in that moment, he also realised he really needed to stop just standing around doing nothing. The wizard rushed forward, recalling the incantation that had helped him countless times in the Third War. It was a perfectly acceptable offensive spell that would at least wound the fell beast he was currently focusing on. However, what he actually unleashed was a wall of raging fire, which burned every single visible demon to ash in an instant. And then there was silence. Brox dropped his axe, his mouth wide in sheer disbelief, whilst Malfurion stared at Cenarius, as if to say, are you sure that wasn't you that did that? This was not the first time this had happened, Ronan thought. Something similar had happened back when he and Krasis first arrived in this era, in the forest. But Ronan wasn't given much time to feel really pleased with himself, because a sudden excruciating pain shot through his back. It felt as if his very soul was being drained away. Brox and Malfurion rushed towards him, yelling something about yet another fell beast, but Ronin then passed out. Meanwhile, Duranda made her way through the corridors of the temple, past countless chambers of sleeping acolytes. However, a sentry appeared out of nowhere. Sister, you really should stay in your quarters and get some sleep. You've hardly had any rest for days. Your friend will be all right. I'm certain of it. They were obviously talking about Illidan, who Tyrande was somewhat worried about, but to be honest, her concerns were for someone else. I hope he realises how much you care for him. Time for your choosing's fast approaching, isn't it? Those words bothered Tyrande a lot, so she brushed past the bemused guard and walked out of the temple, only to find Lord Ravencrest, his men and Illidan just now arriving back from their venture. Well. If it isn't the most lovely of the Mother Moon's dedicated servants. How interesting to find you awaiting our return despite the late hour. Very interesting, don't you think, Illidan? The commander smiled and winked towards his new personal sorcerer. Yes, my lord. We must make for Blackrook Hall, sister. But I think I can spare a precious moment for you two. Ravencrest guided the rest of the party away, leaving Tyrande and Illidan alone with darkened face cheeks. They're safe. Geranda. Lord Ravencrest has taken me under his wing. We fought a fearsome beast, and I destroyed it with my own power. Malfurion escaped. You're certain of it? Of course, of course. Illidan waved away any further questions about his brother. I've found my destiny, Geranda. The Moonguard all but ignored me, but I slew a monster that killed several of theirs. Geranda wanted to hear more about Malfurion and the Orc. But obviously Illidan was caught up in his own fantasticness at the moment. It was understandable though. He had spent a long time working very hard and fruitlessly to achieve the glorious future so many had predicted for him. I'm glad for you. I feared that you were frustrated with the pacing of Cenarius' teachings, but it seems they've come in handy. What? No, I didn't use those slow, cumbersome spells that Malfurion's adored Shando shows us again and again. I use good traditional night elf sorcery. It was exhilarating. Illidan! I have to go, Tyrande. I am to be shown my place at the Hold. Then organize a larger party to retrieve the dead beasts and all the bodies. Bodies? The creatures wiped out the original pursuit to a single soldier, Tyrande. There was a weird tone to Illidan's voice, almost gleeful. The sorcerers perished immediately. No help at all. And yet I killed one creature with just a spell. Illidan! Illidan then grabbed Tyrande's hand and kissed it, before suddenly murmuring, I wanted to be worthy of you, and soon 
I will be. And then he buggered off, leaving a very confused and kind of pissed off Tyrande behind. It's time. Crisis wasn't quite sure how long he'd been sat with the eggs, waiting for Alex Strauss's return. Felt like about two weeks, probably. I'm ready. So the Dragon Mage and the Queen of Life made their way through a bunch of passages, until finally they arrived at an opening, overlooking a vast, cloudy region. And it was in this moment that Crisis suddenly realised the air up here was actually quite thin, so he went all wobbly. Perhaps this might not be the best thing for you. But Crisis then felt a sudden renewed strength course through him, because Coriolstras then approached. I trust I'm not too late. You are not. Do you feel up to the journey? Until this very moment, I thought perhaps I could not, but it seems I'm feeling better again. Coriolstras' gaze flickered towards Crisis for a moment, as if he was starting to notice a bit of a pattern, but he said nothing. The Dragon Queen then ushered Crisis to jump on Coriolstras' back, which would have been weird if the direct contact with his past self didn't make him feel even stronger, so he was quite happy to do so. Are you settled? I am. And so, off they all buggered, taking flight and soaring through the skies at astonishing speed, dipping and barrel rolling and all sorts of things. Not once did they have to land and recharge their vigour. Ten paragraphs of flying, to be precise. But eventually, they arrived at a monumental cavern. But inside said cavern, Crisis was surprised to see an absolutely flawless chamber. No stalactites or stalagmites, no fissures, not even a crack. And despite his bonk memory, Crisis recalled that this was the Chamber of the Aspects. But the mage could also see that it was quite clearly empty. None of the other aspects were here. Something his younger self had obviously picked up on as well. You spoke to them all? Only Asira. She said she'd contact the others. And I did what I could. An emerald form then appeared out of thin air, albeit not fully solidifying and surrounded by a slightly dreamy haze. I'm pleased that you've come so swiftly, good Asira. I come because you are my sister, my friend. I come because you would not request a gathering if you did not have good reason. And the others? Nosdormu is the only one I could not reach directly. You know his ways. I was forced to contact one who serves him. They said they'd do what they could to let their master know. That's all I could do, I'm afraid. Alex Straza nodded, barely hiding her disappointment. Then even if the others attend, we cannot come to a final decision. Crisis was doubly concerned for Nosdormu's radio silence. To be perfectly honest, the Timeless One was likely the only aspect that would actually be able to help him. It was looking more and more like the other option, the one where Ronin and Crisis were eliminated, was going to be the thing. A couple of random fireworks then went off above everyone's heads, as a huge blue shape took form. Another dragon, with an extremely merry expression on his face. Welcome, Malagos. Such a pleasure to see you, Queen of Life. You too, my fair dream. Ysira smiled, coyly. How fares your realm? As wondrous as I would wish it. Filled with brightness, filled with colours, filled with young. Are you not well? I'm fine. Just... Crasus was quite thankful that Coriolstras could not see his face. Seeing Malagos had just made him feel extremely uncomfortable. Every fibre of his being wanted to tell the blue aspect about the future about his fate. And this? Is this the one to whom we owe this gathering? It is. Malagos then sniffed to the air. He has the scent of us upon him, and I do detect old magic surrounding him. Is he bespelled? We should let him tell his own story, once the others have arrived. Well, that was nice of Alexstrasza, to spare Crasis an interrogation. One more arrives now. The ceiling rippled, shimmered, and then a huge winged form phased through it. Black as the night sky, radiating the power of the world itself. You called and I have come. It's always good to see my friend Alex Straza. And I welcome your presence, dear Naltharian. Seeing Malagos had made Crisis uncomfortable, but now he was physically shaking. I was surprised when Asira not you contacted me. You are well, Alex Straza. I am. And you, young Coriel Straz? You're not at your best, I think. A passing illness. It's an honour to see you again, Earthwater. Now Tharian then lifted his gaze from Cariel Strauss to Krasis. And you, you have a name. Krasis. <laughs> a defiant little one. Seems he is indeed a dragon, as Asira hinted. A dragon with a tale to tell. 
but I would prefer to give Nosdormu more time before we begin. Give the Timeless One more time? Heh. <laughs> Both Neltharion and Malagos then shuffled to one side, deep in conversation for a bit. It's good that Neltharion has Malagos to turn to. He's been quiet with me of late. I sense a distance too. He does not take the action by these night elves with pleasure. He stated once that they have grandiose ideas of becoming like the creators. There may be something to that. Alexstrasza glanced towards Krasis for a moment, which just made the mage feel even more uncomfortable. He was having a real internal crisis now. He just wanted to blurt out everything. Change the future. Save its loves from slavery. His children from needless sacrifice. Malagos from witnessing his own flight be decimated and going batshit crazy. And out of frustration, Krasis then glared at one of the causes of all of those things. Deathwing. However, Notharian's eyes then met his own, and seemingly glared back. No, Krasis thought. Had the darkness already descended upon the Earth Warder? Had his pleasant demeanour at this gathering been nothing more than a lie? When had Notharian turned to betrayal, he wondered, cursing his adult memory? Was it meant to be now? You know me, but I do not know you. The chilling voice filled Krasis' head, and he prayed that someone, anyone, would notice what just happened. But, nope. You would speak against me. You would have the others distrust their comrade of old. Their brother. Well, that settled that then. Krasis could quite clearly sense in Neltharion a raging paranoia, an adamant belief that no one but he knew what was good for the world. A belief that anyone that was even the slightest threat was true evil. You will not be allowed to spread any of your malicious falsehoods. He's not coming. Is here his sudden declaration put a pause on that little chat? He may still appear. No, I was just contacted by the one with whom I spoke. They can't find him. The Timeless One is somewhere beyond the mortal plane. Balls, Kratos thought. I agree then. I'll have to go on without the full five. There's no rule where we cannot discuss the matter after the story is told, even if a course of action cannot be taken. Everyone then immediately looked expectantly towards Krasis, so he hopped off his younger self's back. I am one of you. My true name is known to the Queen of Life, but for now, I am simply Krasis. He bellows well, this hatchling. Krasis immediately shot Malagos a stern look. Now is not the time for jokes, especially for you, Guardian of Magic. This is a time when a balance is nigh upset. A terrible mistake, a distortion of reality threatens everything. How dramatic. You will hear my story. You will hear it and understand. For there is a worse danger on the horizon. One which touches us as well. You see... Fway. Everyone's head sort of side twitched. That was weird. You having a stroke? Um... Fway. <clears throat> Grace has looked to Alexstrasza for help, but she was now also looking at him as if he'd gone mental. The mage's head then started to spin, and I guess we all know what's happening next. But as his legs buckled and vertigo took hold, Krasis heard the deathly calm voice of Neltharion once again. I did warn you. And then, Krasis passed out. In the city of Gauhara, on the opposite side of the well from Zinashari, a bunch of sorcerers prepared to do their nightly ritual of realigning the emerald crystals that lined their city's borders. These crystals acted as a sort of defence against general magic attacks. Never actually been needed, but the people still took comfort in their presence. However, on this particular occasion, the crystals looked a bit dim, with some of them darkened completely, and the sorcerers of Galhara just stood there and looked at each other. They're not drawing properly from the well. No sooner had the young spellcaster pointed out the obvious, the crystals then started to glow, renewing their normal activities. And again... Sorcerers all just kind of looked at each other. Oh, well, I guess there's nothing to worry about. It's failed! Hakar was absolutely furious, and Xavius was also pretty displeased. They'd spent several hours trying to cut the well off, and just as the Houndmaster had stated, they had failed. What can we do? For the first time, Xavius read uncertainty in Hakar's face. Bloke looked scared. We must ask him. So... Lord Xavius stepped forward and took a knee. Is the portal strengthened? Nay, Great One. The work in that regard has not progressed as we hoped. 
The portal flared for a moment, with what almost seemed like insane fury. Must have just imagined that though, Xavius thought. You seek something. Speak. So, the Lord Counselor went ahead and explained the notion of sealing off the well's power from all but the palace. I had already considered this. The one I sent first has failed in his duty. What? Another will be sent to you. You must make certain that the portal is made ready for him. Another, my lord. I now send you one of my commanders. He will ensure that what is needed will come to pass. And that was the end of that conversation. He sends us one of his commanders. Do you know which one? Aye. I know which one. Well, we must make ready. He'll be coming immediately. After a few moments of the Highborn waving their arms about at the portal, the huge dark figure then stepped out of it. You have disappointed him. I have no excuse, Manoroth. No, you do not. There will be no more failures. The huge behemoth then turned his gaze towards Xavius. The Great One approves of your efforts, Lord Night Elf. Oh my god, Xavius thought. I've been blessed. The plan will be followed. We'll cut off the place of power from the rest of this realm. Then the arrival of the host can begin in earnest. Sargeras himself will want to be here when the world is cleansed. Very, very much. Meanwhile, Ronin woke up with a bunch of grass and mud in his mouth. At least he hoped it was mud. He pushed himself up, which took quite a bit of effort, to realise that he was now in some random wood. Not the Forest Lord's special realm anymore. Just a wood. The sudden fear that he'd been thrust into yet another realm crossed his mind before he started to recall what had actually happened. Although he'd passed out whilst being dragged off by the sneaky fell beast, he'd apparently regained consciousness at some point long enough to cast a spell. A spell to escape, said sneaky fell beast. Great. So he could be literally anywhere. A few miles away, or on the complete other side of the world. However, a rustling bush noise sounded nearby. And then Brox appeared. No quarrel, human. It's just me. Are you alone? Was, until I saw you. You make a lot of noise, human. You move like a drunken infant. I meant Malfurion. He was also nearby when I cast the spell. If you were drawn into it, he might have been. Fair enough. Didn't see him. Saw no fell beast either. Well, that was good news, Ronin thought. Any idea where we might be? Woods. <sighs> Thanks. Well, I was planning on going this way. You have any better ideas? Should wait till sunrise. Better to see than the night elves. They don't like the sun. Ronin didn't particularly feel comfortable waiting for daylight, and Rox obviously picked up on that. Your direction's as good as any. So, off they buggered in that direction. Rox, how did you get here? Not this exact location. I know that, obviously. But how did you come to this realm? Rox then went ahead and regaled the events of whichever chapter it was, with the wobbly distortion and his young companion getting exploded. Do you understand what swallowed us? Wizard spell. Bad one. Sent us far from home. Farther than you might know. Ronin decided that Brox had a right to the truth, regardless of what Krasis might think. So he informed the Orc of the fact that they were 10,000 years in the past and stuff. And to his surprise, Brox accepted it quite readily. Can we return, human? I don't know. You saw. Demons are here. The Legion is here. This is the first time they tried to invade our world. Most beyond Dalaran don't know that history anymore. We'll fight them. No, we can't. We might change history by interfering. <laughs> you already fought. That simple statement shut Ronin up. He had indeed already fought, and was now back to questioning whether that had been the right choice or not. The two then moved on in silence, with Ronin battling inner demons whilst Brox kept a wary eye out for real ones. However, as they moved through the forest, the foliage above grew thicker and thicker, blocking out the moonlight and making it very difficult to keep going, until eventually they had no choice but to turn back. But, as they turned around, the way they'd just come from was now completely blocked by dodgy looking trees. We came from through there. I know we did. Agreed. Brox then raised his new axe, and we go back that way too. The orc then went to take a swing, only for huge branch-like hands to suddenly seize the weapon. And as Ronin watched his new orc companion disappear up into the sky, something struck him on the back of the head 
However, instead of striking harsh ground, he hits something soft. A body. Ugh. You. It's mine, you bastard. Malfurion sat up immediately, scanning the trees above. Brox, do not fight them. They mean you no harm. They're trying to take my axe. Just do as I say. They are protectors. Ugh. Bollocks. After a few minutes of everything and everyone calming down. Thank you, brothers of the forest. I know you watched over me until my friends could find me. They mean no harm. They just did not understand. The leaves of the surrounding trees rustled slightly. We'll trouble you no longer. More rustling for a moment, with Brox's axe now landing with a thud from the branches above. And Brox went ahead and grabbed it, before calmly nodding his gratitude to a bunch of trees. You can speak with trees. To a point, and ask them where we are. I already have. Not at all that far from where we were, but far enough. Actually, we're both fortunate and unfortunate. How so? We're only a short distance from my home. Both the Night Elf and Brox didn't seem overjoyed by that revelation. What? That's good news, isn't it? I was captured close to here, wizard. Fine. I'll take it from here, then. I'll know what to expect. You will be sensed immediately by the Moon Guard. They have the skill to usurp your spells. In fact, they may have already sensed the first one. Well, what do you suggest, then? As we're near my home, we should make use of it. There are others who could be of assistance to us. My brother. And Tyrande. The shaman. Cool. Your twin, though. What? Ronin was still worried about Krasis, but with no notion of how to find his former mentor, the Night Elf's plan made the most sense. So, with Malfurion in the lead, the trio head off. A demigod, Cenarius. Did he teach you how to talk to trees? Yes, he is my teacher. I seem to be the first to truly understand his ways. Even my brother prefers the powers of the well to the ways of the forest. The sheer mention of the well caused Ronin to feel ever so slightly excited. The well of eternity. The fabled fount of power. Was that why his own magics were amplified, he thought? We're not far. Only a few more minutes and... However, before Malfurion could finish that sentence, the trio suddenly found themselves absolutely surrounded. An excellent piece of work, lad. Tis the beastman we sought, and no doubt the one who aided in his escape. A mumbly grumbly voice from behind the commander spoke up, but too low for Ronin to make out. However, the person with that voice then stepped forward, and Ronin's eyes widened. His garments were different, and his hair, but other than that, he had exactly the same face as Malfurion. It is good then. Yes. Very good. Sargeras will be pleased. There it was again, Xavius thought. The Great One's true name. And what a glorious name it was. We will work the portal the moment the spell is set in place. First will come the host. Then, when all is ready, my lord himself. Hakkar then approached, looking almost pathetic now, ever since Manoroth had arrived. Forgive this interruption, but one of my hunters has returned. Only one? So it seems. And what have you learned from it? They found two with the scent of otherness that the Lord Night Elf spoke of, plus one of his own kind with them. But in the hunt they fell afoul of a being of power. Now it was Manoroth's turn to display a slight hint of uncertainty. Not. No. I think not. Perhaps with a touch of their power. Perhaps a guardian left behind. The two then discussed something that sounded significant, but was completely lost on Lord Xavius. But taking a risk, he then interrupted. Was there a description of this creature of power? Aye. Hakar then conjured a tiny image of the creature in question. Seen through the eyes of the fell beast. An antlered entity. Seeing the image, the Lord Counselor then frowned. The legend is true then. The Forest Lord is real. You know this creature? Ancient myths speak of the Forest Lord. A demigod called Cenarius. He's said to be the child of the Mother Moon. <laughs> Nothing, then. He will be dealt with. What about the others? Hakar quickly obeyed, his conjured image shifting to that of a green-skinned, muscly brute, a young night elf, and a weird-looking red-haired freak. A curious trio. The warrior shows much promise. I would see more of his kind. Learn their potential. What? 
That beast? Surely not. It's more grotesque than a dwarf. Manoroth ignored that, changing the subject to the red-haired figure. A spindly creature, with wary eyes. A creature of magic, I think. More fell beasts could be sent to find them. You really are a one-trick pony, aren't you? We've sent fell beast and fell guard. Only this time, the objective will be capture. Capture? They must be studied. Their strengths, their weaknesses, in case there are others. Can the fell guard be spared? There will soon be many more. Lord Night Elf, are your highborn prepared? They are ready to do what they must, to see the glorious fulfillment of our dream. The cleansing of the world of all that is- The world will be cleansed, Lord Night Elf. You may trust to that. I leave the hunt to you, Master. Do not fail again. I can't then bug it off, to get right on that. And now, Lord Night Elf, let us begin the moulding of your people's future. Meanwhile- <laughs> If it isn't a bit of old dragon meat, Cory Elstras. You've been around the lesser races much too long. Their weakness has rubbed off on you. Shut up! You're of no use to anyone. Shut up! A horrendous sandstorm then filled the screen. However, instead of facing Deathwing, Krasis now found himself looking at a different dragon. Lost Dormer. We are stretched through all. We see all. What? All ends lead to nothing. All ends. But one. What do I do? Instead of answering that question in a straightforward manner with words, Dragon Nosdormu's form shifted again, this time to a random night elf. Well, who the bloody hell is that? Annoyingly, the sandstorm then filled the screen again, only this time, the sand itself ripped at Kratos' flesh, and it bloody hurt. Well, that's embarrassing. Are you alright? Kratos attempted to speak, but immediately realised he was still very dizzy. Take it easy. You need more rest. I don't need rest, Kratos thought. I need this subtle shit spell that the Earth Warder has cast upon me removed. But there was nothing anyone could do about that for the time being. How far are we from the land of the Night Elves? We can take you there soon enough. But what happened back there? This concerns that matter. My course has changed. I believe I was contacted by the Timeless One. I think he was trying to tell me something. It was a dream. A nightmare. That's all. I don't think the aspect of time would reach out to you. Alex Straza, perhaps. But not you. No. I believe he may have the truth of it, Coriel Straz. If he says the Timeless One touched his thoughts, I suspect he states fact. Well, then I bow to your wisdom, my love. I need to get to the Night Health. There's one thing I seek. I just pray I'm not already too late. Alex Straza's head tilted to the side a little bit. Is all you told me before still truth? All of it. It is. But I fear there's much more. The dragons, all dragons, will be needed for a struggle. With Nordstormu absent, a consensus cannot be reached. The others will not agree to anything. Then you must convince them. Go against tradition. You could very well be all that stands between the world and oblivion. And with that, Gracious went ahead and told them about the Burning Legion. A tale of blood of decimation, of soulless evil. But still, they may still not decide. We watch the world, but we leave its progress in the hands of the younger races. Even Neltharion, the warder of Earth itself, prefers to leave it that way. Krasis really wanted to tell them about Neltharion as well, but even thinking about the guy made his head swim. I know you will do what you must. And you must do what you will. Go to the Night Elves and seek your answer. Alex Strauser then turned to her consort, I ask that you go with him, Coriolstras. You ask and I'm happy to oblige. I also ask that you follow his lead. Trust me when I say that he has wisdom which will be of value to you. It was not entirely clear if Coriolstras believed that last part, but he nodded anyway. Night has fallen. Will you wait until light? I've already waited far too long as it is. Meanwhile again, inside a cell within Blackrook Hold. Once again, my Lord Ravencrest. I must request that these outsiders be turned over for proper questioning. You've already had the beastman and lost him. He was to come to me anyway. 
It simply shortens the procedure. There's more to them than what we see on the surface. Illidan, I would hear from you. Malfurion's brother looked slightly unwell, but answered quickly. Yes, my lord. He is my brother. That's as obvious as night and day, my boy. And the commander then studied Illidan's twin. I know something of you, lad. Just as I know something of your brother. Your name is Malfurion, yes? Yes, my lord. You rescued this creature? I did. And you've an excellent reason why? One that would excuse this heinous act? I doubt you would believe me, my lord. Oh, I can come to believe many things, young one. If they're spoken in honesty. Can you do that? I... I'll try. So, Malfurion went ahead and explained things. His studies under Scenarius, which immediately caused his audience to raise doubtful eyebrows. He explained his reoccurring dreams, his exploration of the Emerald Dream, the disconcerting things he saw within. The only thing he didn't mention was his fear that Queen Ashara herself was involved. That might be a little bit too much for people to handle. And after finishing, Ravencrest looked towards the Moon Guard that was in attendance. Has your order noticed any such trouble? The well is more turbulent than usual. That could be from misuse. But such an incredible fiction as this. Yes, it is incredible. The commander then turned to Illidan. What say you concerning your brother? He's never been one for delusions, my lord. As to whether it's the truth. Indeed. Still, I wouldn't put it past Lord Xavius and the Highborn to instigate some devilment, without her knowledge. They act as if the Queen is their prized possession, and no one else has a right to her. Even the Moonguard bloke nodded at that. Elitist bastards, those Highborn. If I may, once we've settled matters here, I will pass on word to the heads of our order. They'll put into motion surveillance of the Highborn and their activities. I should be most interested in that. Young Malfurion, your story, on the assumption that it is for the most part truth, explains some of your actions. But how does it fit into your freeing of the prisoner, a treasonous crime? I can perhaps answer that. Considering Night Elves weren't the most tolerant of other races, Malfurion wasn't sure it was a good idea for Ronin to suddenly start talking. But... Go ahead. In my land, a strange magical anomaly opened up. My people sent me, and Brox's people sent him. We both discovered it separately, and were drawn unwillingly through it. He ended one place, I ended another. And how does this pertain to young Malfurion? He believes, as do I, that this anomaly was caused by the spell work mentioned. This green-skinned creature does not seem like one who would be sent to investigate sorcery or magic. My war chief commanded I go, so I went. I cannot speak for orcs, but I am certainly adept at magic. There was a brief pause, but the Moonguard sorcerer then nodded. He may not have known exactly what Ronin was, but he could recognise someone versed in the arts. Perhaps I'm getting old, but I'm inclined to believe much of this. Well, I remain undecided. We cannot take such claims on faith alone. There must still be an internal interrogation. Did I say otherwise? Ravencrest then snapped his fingers, and a bunch of guards suddenly seized Malfurion. I would like to test the faith I've placed in my new personal sorcerer. Illidan, we must ascertain the absolute truth, however distasteful that might seem to you. I trust I can rely on you to prove to us that all your brother says is true. Illidan swallowed hard, but then looked beyond Malfurion. My brother's word I trust, my lord. But I can't say the same for the robed creature. On the one hand, Malfurion appreciated Illidan's attempt to avoid using his powers on him, but he wasn't a big fan of Ronin or Brock's suffering instead. However, Lord Commander, this is absurd. An unsanctioned spellcaster is also the brother of one of the prisoners. Bit of a conflict of interest, wouldn't you say? In accordance with our laws, any and all magical matters are the responsibility and right of the Moon Guard to oversee. The Moonguard Sorcerer then stepped forward, but... My lord, I will interrogate my brother. Unfortunately, the Master of Blackrock Hold let out a big sigh. The lord shall be followed. He's yours, Moonguard. But only if you do the questioning here and now. Agreed. Consider in your work that he may be telling the truth. Fine. Hold his head straight. The guards holding Malfurion positioned him accordingly. 
whilst the elven sorcerer placed his hands on Malfurion's face. And that was followed by an immediate shock. And then another one. And another one. Struggle not. Release your secrets. Malfurion really wanted to release his secrets, but he didn't really know how to. His mind then raced with memories of everything he'd already told the Gathering. But this time, it did include his belief of Ashara's involvement and duplicity. The shocks to his face then ceased, and his legs buckled beneath him as he almost passed out. He didn't, but it's important to remember that it almost happened, and gradually became aware of shouts of disbelief around the room. However, as Malfurion's mind cleared a little bit more, he realised his brother was now standing in front of him, not the Moon Guard. Why didn't you give in immediately? Two hours. Do you even have a mind left? Two hours? Oh, praise the loom. After you spouted that nonsense about the Queen, that old fool was determined to rip everything from your head regardless of cost. If not for his spell failing suddenly, he probably would have left you an empty husk. Is... his spell failed? This barely made any sense, Malfurion thought. All of their spells failed. After he lost control of the first, he tried another. And when that didn't work, his companion attempted a third. No success. It's as if we've been cut off from the well. Then it's begun. Hmm? What has? Meanwhile, outside Ashara's palace, night elves from across the entire continent had already started to gather, panicked, confused, feeling the loss of their connection to the well. Surely Ashara, their queen, their light of the moons of the moons of the light of the moons or whatever, would have answers. But, twas not the queen that came out of said gates, twas an army. We'll soon be in sight of Zinashari. What do you hope to see? It was more what Krasis hoped not to see, to be honest. His mind was still addled, but he remembered enough to know that the Well of Eternity was power. And power was not only what the Burning Legion sought, but also the very thing that probably allowed them to reach this realm in the first place. I do not know yet. Just keep going. Soon enough, lights filled the horizon. Countless ridiculously bright lights. Zinashari was the night elven capital, a sprawling grand metropolis the likes of which the world would never see again. But this still seemed like too many lights. And as the duo neared, they discovered why. It was not torchlight or crystals. It was raging fires. The city's ablaze. We need to descend. Corelstras went ahead and did that, dropping hundreds of feet. And with the closer look, the two could now see that the streets were absolutely filled with dead bodies. Brutally slaughtered, including elderly, infirm, and young. There's been war here. No. Not war. Genocide. Corelstras then veered towards the city centre, curiously noting that the damage lessened more and more as they neared the palace. In fact, some sections seemed completely untouched by the devastation. What do you know of these sections? Districts that belong to the Highborn, the most esteemed of the Night Elves. Well, that was certainly suspicious. There's movement to the northwest, Crisis. Gabriel Stars immediately flew towards said movement. However, probably regretted that decision as soon as the two discovered what it was. An army of demons marching relentlessly through the city. We have to leave. Abandon the fight. Never. We need to get word to those that can do more. Meanwhile... Your Majesty. Captain, what is the cause of that awful racket? It would be easier to show you, my Queen. So, the captain escorted the Queen to a nearby balcony overlooking the city. Explain this to me, Captain. The Lord Counselor has said that to fully prepare for a world of perfection, all the imperfect must be swept away, and those below were considered lacking in the judgment of Lord Xavius. Indeed, Your Majesty. With the recommendation of the Great One's Celestial Commander, Manoroth. Well, if Manoroth says it must be so, then it must be so. Sacrifices are always required in the name of glorious pursuits. Your wisdom is boundless, my Queen. The Queen accepted that compliment dismissively, 
continuing to gaze at the carnage below. Will the Great One soon arrive? He will, my queen. Manroth has even graced us with his name. Sargeras. Sargeras? Truly a fit name for a god. Ashara then started fondling her own boob. I trust I'll be given advanced warning when he makes his entrance. I will ensure that you are given ample warning, my queen. Now, if you'll excuse me, duty demands my attention. The captain bowed and marched off, with the queen waving a sort of negligent, didn't really give a shit hand at him, still continuing to stare at the fire and the slaughter below. Sargeras. Sargeras the god, she thought, and his consort, Ashara. Meanwhile again, back at Blackrock Hold, a messenger, being carried by sentries because he could barely stand and looked very worse for wear, was dragged into the room. And now, Lord Ravencrest had a few questions for him. Can you speak? I... I've come to tell you, my lord. I believe it's the end of the world. Dead silence filled the chamber. What do you mean? Has news come from Zinashari? My lord, I come from Zinashari. Impossible. By the best physical means, it would take three to five nights to get here from there. And sorcery is not available. I know what was available better than you. The messenger's angry outburst caught everyone by surprise. The fact that this bloke was completely disregarding the Moon Guard's higher rank suggested he had, in fact, seen some shit. I was sent to plead for help. Those who could funneled what little power they had to send me here. They may be dead. I may be the only one to survive. The city, lad. What of the city? Zinashar is in ruins, Lord. Overrun by monsters. Creatures of nightmare. The messenger then revealed the full story, how the people of the capital had been stunned by the sudden inexplicable loss of their power, how they'd flocked to the palace to seek reassurances, and how an endless multitude of demons poured out of said palace and started slaughtering everyone in sight. We ran, my lord. All of us. Even the most hardened warriors did not stand long. And the palace? The palace too is in ruins. All slaughtered there. My lord, there were sentries atop the walls. They watched the people before the gates opened. And they watched still as the monsters came out. Some murmurs filled the room at that revelation. This must be the work of the highborn. That's insane. True, they think themselves superior, but they are still night elves, just like us. So we would believe. But their arrogance knows no bounds. Let us not forget that the Highborn obey the orders of the Lord Counselor Xavius. Who the bloody hell's Xavius? He who whispers in the Queen's ear. Our most trusted advisor and arrival of Lord Ravencrest. I don't doubt that he's involved, but he couldn't do this without the Queen's compliance. Even the Highborn worship her. They'll never believe that, brother. Forget that for now. Let them think it's the Counselor. Their choices will still be the same in the end. Ronin didn't exactly know or trust Illidan yet, but he had to agree with this other Night Elves' opinion on the matter. Garethal, send out messengers to every military outpost and commander. This foul situation must be contained. The Moonguard then argued yet again. We need to regain the use of the well. Force of arms alone will not stand against those monsters. You heard the messenger. As much as I'd love assistance from your vaunted order, Force of Arms is all we really have at the moment, isn't it? My lord, I feel I may be of some aid. I still have some ability for casting spells. Splendid. We'll need it. Zinashari must be avenged, and the Queen freed from the Highborn. Uh, Mr. Ravencrest, sir. What? You need people who can cast spells. I volunteer. Fine. Mafiorian then stepped forward. You plan to offer sorcery as well? I'd welcome it, if you have it, regardless of your past crimes. I offer not sorcery, Lord Ravencrest, but magic of a different sort. I offer what has been taught to me by my Shando, Scenarius. A couple of snort laughs filled the room, but Ravencrest wasn't laughing. You truly believe you can be of some aid? Yes, but not from here. I need to go somewhere quieter. Quieter? I must go to the Temple of Elun, Lord. The Temple of the Mother Moon. I hadn't even thought of them. Their support is definitely needed in this crisis. 
But what do you hope to achieve there? The removal of the spell which keeps the well's power from our sorcerers, of course. As is tradition, Lord Xavius was just kind of hanging about, feeling really proud of himself. All was well in the world. His dreams, his goals, all within reach. All he had to do was stare at this array thing. Maintain the shield spell that he and Manoroth had put in place. A shield which sealed the well from outside influence, whilst also strengthening the Great One's portal. And since there was absolutely no chance that anyone was going to invade the palace, mission complete, as far as the Lord Counselor was concerned. Where is Manoroth? He commands the host, of course. Currently clearing Zinashari of the unfit. Something in Hakar's face kind of disturbed Xavius. Bloke looked amused. Like something he'd just said was ironic or something. How fares your task? Well, Lord Nighthelf, the Hounds and the Felguard have their orders. Those that Manoroth desires captured will be. The Houndmaster then stalked off, leaving Xavius to continue feeling really proud of himself. He now saw himself closer in rank to Manoroth than that loser anyway. Meanwhile, Sister, there's someone at the front entrance requesting to see you. Thranda's heart sank, assuming the someone in question was Illidan. She was not looking forward to the conversation of a possible match between them. However, Malfurion. It's good to see you, Duranda. What, what are you doing here? A sudden fear then arose within the priestess. Broxiga, what have they done with- He's with me. Don't worry. Malfurion then gestured behind himself and Duranda noted the orc uncomfortably hanging about in a dark corner. What madness brings you here? We were captured. What? That story must wait, Duranda. Do you know of the terror in Zinashari? Only some. We felt it in the minds and souls of our sisters there. Something dreadful. It spreads beyond the capital even as we speak. And what's worse, the Moonguard are helpless against it. Something cuts off the wealth's power from them. So we surmised. But what does that have to do with you coming here? Is the Chamber of the Moon in use? It should be empty now. Good. We need to go there. Malfurion then signalled to Brox, who hurried over, and to Tyrande's surprise, the orc even carried an axe. So, you were captured? Lord Ravencrest saw no reason to detain us, provided Brock stays with me. I owe you both. I owe my life. You owe us nothing. Please, Tyrande, take us to the chamber. The three then head into the temple, but... Go! Sister, it is customary to allow any entry into the Mother Moon's temple, but that creature... Does he not have the same right as any other believer? I are not all children of a loon. Just try to keep him out of sight or something. He's making people gasp uncontrollably. Go! The three important characters then entered the chamber itself. What do you hope to do? I intend to walk the Emerald Dream again. Journey to Zinashari from within. And learn the truth of what has been done to the well. However, Duranda knew him better than that. You don't wish to simply learn the truth. You intend to do something about it. Here seems the most tranquil place. Malfurion. I have to hurry, Tyrande. Forgive me. Malfurion then took a seat on the ground, with Brock sitting down next to him, and Tyrande then also joined them on the floor. You needn't stay. If in any way the Mother Moon can help me guide you, I intend to do so. At that, Malfurion smiled gratefully, before his expression went back to serious face again. I must begin now. And so, Malfurion began now, closing his eyes and drifting off very quickly. And after a whole bunch of paragraphs of faffing about, he floated all the way to the capital. As terrifying as the messenger's description of the destruction which had befallen the city had been, seeing it up close was something else. Large chunks of the city had been razed to the ground. Corpses littered the streets. And as Malfurion entered further in, demons. But this was no horde of mindless monsters. It was an army moving in concert, with terrible purpose. Malfurion quickly pulled away from them and head towards the palace. The last time, Malfurion had attempted to enter at the point where he'd sensed the spell work, in the upper reaches of the palace. And that hadn't worked, so this time, he found a balcony situated fairly low, near the ground floor, and attempted to enter from there. And to his surprise, that actually worked. Once inside, he floated his butt-naked ass through corridor after corridor, making his way up, until eventually, he discovered the barrier 
that had prevented him entrance before. However, Malfurion was much more determined this time, so instead of just reaching out and touching it with his hand, he threw himself entirely at it. And again, to his surprise, and very conveniently, he passed through it. His entrance was so abrupt that it took him a few moments to process that he'd actually been successful. He then pressed a bit further forward, until finally, he reached the room that all the villains had been hanging about in for most of this book. And there, he saw not only the green fiery portal, but also Lord Xavius. Malfurion then studied the room further, noticing Xavius was staring at an array of sorts. It was a masterfully crafted thing, no doubt important. The Lord Counselor certainly seemed obsessed with it. Was this the thing, Malfurion thought? Only one way to find out. So, the young Night Elf Druid went ahead and whispered to the air, making his request while staring intently at the heart of the magical matrix, when suddenly, a foolish thing to attempt. Lord Xavius then turned and said directly at Malfurion, not through him, at him, whilst raising a white crystal. How long do you think it will take for your body to die without your spirit within? I guess we'll find out. And then, Malfurion plunged into darkness as his spirit passed out or something. Meanwhile again, I can bring you no nearer. I understand. You've done more than I could ask. I don't intend to abandon you now. Despite the form you wear, you seem to have forgotten that our kind can shapeshift. I'll transform into something more akin to those we must mingle with. Coriel Strauss then concentrated really hard, shrinking slightly as his form started to change. However, oh, oh, What is it? I can't transform. Even attempting it fills me with agony. Mm-hmm. Don't try it again. I'll go on my own. Are you sure? It seems when we're close we both suffer less with whatever maladies affect us. Anxiety and pride touched Krasis at the same time. His younger self had figured that one out, eh? Did Coriel Strauss know the why, though? I'm certain. Will you remain here? As long as I can. Doesn't look like the Night Elves journey much to this region. The trees are tall, so they'll hide me well. If you need me, though, just call. I will. Grace has then turned and moved to depart. But, do you think you can find the one for which you search? What? The further Krasis moved away from the dragon, the more ill and weary he felt. But he kept going. He had to. He needed to find the random night elf that Nosdormu had maybe shown him in a dream. At least that's what he hoped he needed to do. Otherwise he was just completely and utterly wasting his time. However, as the torches of the city entrance came into sight, so too did a whole bunch of night elves clad in armour, appearing from all sides around him. I'm Captain Jared Shadowsong. You are a prisoner of the Guard of Soromar. Surrender, and you'll be treated fairly. Ronin climbed atop the back of Illidan's mount, and the beast kinda hissed at him. Are you settled? Yeah, sure. Malfurion's brother had been very curious of Ronin since they'd met, almost as if he was trying to learn from the wizard's every movement. But Ronin didn't exactly mind. He could sense this young Night Elf's potential. Out of everyone he'd encountered, Illidan was the only one that came anywhere near having the same magical ability. And it was in everyone's best interest if Ronin helped the young buck as much as he could, provided Illidan was willing to learn. Against the Burning Legion, they were going to need any and every advantage they could get. Lord Ravencrest then ordered his expeditionary force forward, and so they set off, riding out of Suramar in the direction of Zinashari. Despite the force being a very large one, over a thousand, with more due to join, there was still trepidation in the air, and rightly so. Ronin had done his best to really emphasise just how horrific and destructive their foe would be. Ravencrest had adjusted his tactics accordingly. A contingent of his finest fighters were to surround the Moon Guard at all times, ordered to strike at the fell beast's tentacles first, removing the threat of the sorcerers being turned into raisins. And any other weaknesses that Ronin could think of had also been communicated to the soldiers. Now it was just a case of hoping they could all keep their nerve. The Night Elves eventually neared their destination, noticing an eerie green light illuminating from an area up ahead. Something's coming. And fast. It's them. The Legion never wastes time. They live to fight. I would have preferred to scout the area, but if they wish to fight immediately, then by all means. We shall not disappoint them. Sound the call. So, horns blared 
and the lines of the Night Elves spread out into battle formation. Now an army of several thousand, the sight of which reminded Ronin of the might of the Alliance, the first time they'd faced the Legion's allies, the Scourge. Unfortunately, things had not gone well for that giant Alliance army on that occasion. But that wasn't going to happen this time, Ronin thought. He then glanced at Illidan, who was looking rather uncharacteristically unsure of himself. Don't lose yourself in fear. You have a gift, Illidan. The well may be cut off, but its essence still permeates the land. The sky. Everything. If you know how to sense it, you can do anything. I follow your wisdom, Shando. Ronin wasn't entirely sure what that meant, but okay. A chorus of horrific battle cries then filled the air. Archers, stand ready. More than a thousand curved bows then aimed skyward as Lord Ravencrest raised his hand, and as the monsters emerged on the horizon, his hand dropped. Now, we all know that I'm crap at action scenes. I don't have any qualifications in animation whatsoever. So we're going to go full-blown audiobook for a second. After the archers' initial volleys, Ronin and Illidan proved to be very good at killing demons. Illidan's spell is somewhat distasteful and weirdly sadistic, but probably nothing to worry about. The Moonguard, however, proved to be very useless. They prove even more useless when an Eridar warlock shows up and starts melting their skins off. So the battle is pretty even Stevens. Something was going to need to happen in order to break this stalemate, because a war of attrition was not going to end well for the good guys. And there you go, I just summed up seven pages in one paragraph. Shaman, has there been any change? Nothing. The body breathes, but the spirit is absent. It had been three nights since Malfurion had journeyed into the Emerald Dream, with Tyrande watching over his body. They'd moved him to this spare room because the Chamber of the Moon had been kind of needed for other purposes, but things were not looking good. He may sleep forever. His body may wither and die from the lack of sustenance. Brox then touched Tyrande's arm gently. Shaman, you've not slept. Let's step out. Get some air. I can't just leave. There's nothing we can do for him right now. He'll be safe. Everyone else saw Brox as a barbaric creature, but more and more, Tyrande realised that just wasn't true at all. He was a big softy, and he was right. She couldn't help Malfurion if she herself grew weak or ill. So, both the Orc and Priestess made their way out of the temple and started their little stroll. However, Sister, forgive me. I'm Captain Jared Shadowsong. You wish something of me, Captain? A bit of your time, if I may be so bold. I have a prisoner who's in need of aid. To be honest, Duranda wasn't that interested in helping, but duties took priority. Very well. The captain then looked at the orc for a moment. Is, um, is that coming with us? Would you rather he stand out in the square by himself? At that, the captain reluctantly shook his head, turned, and quickly led the pair on. Eventually, they arrived at their destination. We found him in the woods the evening Lord Ravencrest and his force departed. He was quite weary and seems to be getting worse. Because of his peculiar nature, I want him alive if and when Lord Ravencrest returns. That's why I came to see you. Tyrande studied the prisoner. He was indeed peculiar. He looks like one of us, but not. Like a ghost of one of us, yeah. However, the prisoner seemed more interested in Brox. What is an orc doing here? He knows what Brox is, Tyrande thought. That's interesting. The prisoner then started to cough violently, so the priestess got to work, doing some priestess stuff. You're gifted. I had hoped for that. What ails you? Nothing your abilities can cure, I'm afraid. I convinced the captain to find one such as you because time is running scarce. You never told me to do any such thing. I went by my own choice. As you say. The prisoner then returned his attention to Brox. Now, you are something I did not calculate on. And that worries me. You shouldn't be here. <laughs> wizard said that too. What? What wizard? One with flame for her. The prisoner then started to laugh. Either chance, fate, or Nosdormu moves this matter forward. Praise be. Forgive my manners. You may call me Krasus. Krasus? Ronan spoke of you. Elder, 
I am Broxigar. This is the shaman, Taranda. Brox's reaction and attitude towards Crisis was enough to convince Taranda, so she immediately turned to the captain. I would like to take him back with me to the temple. Out of the question. If he escapes, you have my promise that he will not. Besides, you yourself said it was essential that he be well. After all, if he must face Lord Ravencrest... Ah, <sighs> fine. Well, I'll have to escort you there myself. Of course. Joranda then turned back to Crisis, and as she did, the priestess noticed him sort of stifling a satisfied smile. Something pleases you. For the first time since my inopportune arrival, there's hope. The group then returned to the temple, and Taranda, being completely and utterly an autopilot, led them directly to the door of the room in which Malfurion was. It wasn't what she'd intended to do, but obviously her mind was still somewhat obsessing over him. Is there a problem? No. It's... This room's being used for a stricken friend of mine. Out of nowhere, Grace has pulled himself free of both Taranda and Brox's grasp, and burst towards Malfurion's prone form. Chance fate or Nosdormu indeed. What ails him? Quickly. I... He walked the Emerald Dream. He's not come back, Elder. Not come back? Where did he seek to go? The Orc then explained what had happened, and Krasis's face somehow went even more pale than it already was. Of all the places. But it makes bitter sense. If only I'd known before I'd left there. You were in Zinashari. I was in what remained of the city. But I came here in search of your very friend. And if, as you say, he's been like this for the past few nights, I may be too late. For all of us. News of the Night Elf Army had taken Lord Xavius a little bit by surprise, but he was still very confident. He'd seen how many of the Great One's hosts had flooded through the portal. Hell, they were still arriving. The pace increases. I am pleased. I am honoured. There is resistance. Merely some of the unfit delaying the inevitable. The portal must be protected. It must be strengthened more. Soon, I will come through. At that, Lord Xavius' heart leapt. It was bloody exciting. The counsellor then immediately turned back to the array. Thankfully, it was still intact, despite that pesky intruder's attempt to destroy it. And thinking of said pesky intruder, Xavius then considered what he might possibly do with the knob. Perhaps he'd gift the crystal containing that jerk's spirit to Sargeras. After all, he was one of the three that Manoroth had tasked Hakar with capturing. The fact that Xavius had done Hakar's job for him would certainly make the Lord Counselor look super awesome cool. Meanwhile, Malfurion drifted within the crystal, trapped, helpless. But the worst part was that he could see pretty much everything going on outside. He could see the endless stream of demonic warriors exiting the portal, and Lord Xavius looking really pleased with himself. Stupid, Malfurion thought. I've failed. Failed my friends. My race. My world. Now there was nothing but Lord Ravencrest's defenders standing in the way of the demons. But the young druid wasn't going to give up yet. Stealing himself, Malfurion concentrated really hard, thinking on all that Scenarius had taught him. He ran his hands around the inner walls and found nothing. Balls. Thousands were going to die because of him. Illidan would perish. Brox would perish. Tyrande. Malfurion then pictured her lovely face. By a loon, he'd love to see that face again. He had no doubt in his mind that she'd spent the last several nights sat near his body, desperately trying to summon him back. He could almost hear her voice calling to him. Malfurion. Okay, he could definitely hear her voice calling to him. Malfurion, can you hear me? Tyrande? He responded. I can hear him. Uh, Tyrande? How... Did you reach me? Thanks, Thanks to another. To another. He's, He's been, been searching, searching for you. you. Who the bloody hell would that be? Malfurion thought. Not Brox. Bloke was honourable and courageous, but he didn't have any magical ability. Ronin? Possible. But that would make little sense. The wizard had already ridden off with Lord Ravencrest. My, My name, name is Krasis. The sudden switch of voices unsettled Malfurion a bit. It was a voice like none he'd ever felt. Though in some ways, hinted at Cenarius's. Whoever this crisis bloke was, he was definitely more than just some night elf. Do you, you sense us? us? I do, Crisis. 
I showed Taranda how to use her bond with you to reach out to your dream self. The trick is difficult, but we hope to do it only long enough to free you. Free me? My fury in thought. That doesn't seem likely. It's a cunning trap, yes. But I've dealt with its like before. Really? What do we do? I must see the crystal. Every facet of its nature. You are a druid, so you can show me. My fury in thought about that for a moment. Sort of understanding. He then started to survey the entire interior of his magical cell, looking here, there, and everywhere. There. That, that corner. corner. There's a fault. fault. Only, Only slight. slight. Touch, Touch it, it with your mind. mind. Sense, Sense it. it. Mavirian went ahead and did that. Sure enough, sensing a very minuscule flaw in the crystal. Now, now use, use the skills skill the Forest Lord, Lord taught you to locate his most vulnerable, vulnerable point. point. I... Yes. I feel it. Mafurian then tried to press against it, but nothing. You are strong, but not yet fully trained. Open your thoughts further to us. Let us in, so that we can be your added strength. The young druid cleared his mind as much as he could, opening himself up to Taranda in the mysterious crisis, and immediately felt two distinct presences. Try again. Mafurian tried again, pressing against the weak point, now also able to feel the other two pressing with him. And boof! The druid then squeezed out, expanding back to his normal height. He was free! Now, now return, return to, to us, us, before, before you're noticed. noticed. But, Mafurian had different ideas. Lord Xavius was currently preoccupied, seemingly in deep conversation with the green portal. So, Malfurion moved towards the array. He then reached out with his power, altering the components of the mechanism, moving stuff around and fiddling indiscriminately. And for a brief moment, the shield spell faltered. However, both Lord Xavius and the being he was talking to beyond the portal instantly sensed the wrongness. And after a whole bunch of pratfalls and nonsense that ultimately just leads to Malfurion leaving the room, he quickly floated to a nearby hidey hole and waited. Sure enough, the Lord Counselor came furiously running out of the chamber, assuming Malfurion had head down the stairs, so also heading that way. And as soon as Malfurion felt certain the coast was clear, he floated right back into the chamber and towards the array again. As he reached it, a sense of dread filled him, and Malfurion shivered as his attention was drawn towards the fiery green portal. You will not touch the shield. You do not wish to. You wish only to serve me. I will not be one of your pawns. Screaming from the effort, Malfurion tore his gaze from the vortex. He had to see this through. He had to destroy the array once and for all. But annoyingly, his dream form twisted, suddenly racked with incredible pain, and from behind him, he heard the Lord Counselor's voice. No more games. Meanwhile again, more and more, the Burning Legion had crushed the lines of the Night Elf Defenders. Lord Ravencrest had done his best to keep the Night Elves from being completely ripped apart, but things were not looking good. Especially since the senior sorcerer of the Moonguard was just outright ignoring the Commander's orders at this point. Something both Ronin and Illidan had noticed. That damned old idiot's making no use of them at all. I could lead them better. Forget them. Concentrate on your own spells. Said senior sorcerer then suddenly reeled, grabbing at his own throat whilst vomiting blood. Great. Another Eridar warlock. Ronin scanned the battlefield, quickly finding the culprit. He then seized several arrows in flight and sent them hurtling down towards the warlock. However, the warlock just glanced up, saw the incoming bolts and laughed raising a magical defensive shield. That Eridar stopped laughing though, when each arrow just straight up penetrated his shield and went right into his face. Not as strong as you thought you were. Ronin then turned back to where Illidan had been, only to see the bloke making a mad dash towards the moon guard. And as he reached them, he started directing them all, as if he was born to do it. As one, they drew upon what little power they had, and started to channel it through him, and he, in turn, unleashed some magnified powerful spells of his own. However, what Illidan didn't see, as he let out a triumphant cheer, was the extremely strained look on each of the Moonguard's faces behind him. There was not much Ronin could do at this moment to let Illidan know that if he repeated that tactic too often, the Moonguard were going to burn out. And to be honest, Ronin wasn't entirely sure that even if he could tell him that, he would. Meanwhile again again, Manoroth looked at the battlefield before him. This struggle would come to a close soon. Sargeras would no doubt reward Manoroth well having achieved all this without having to ask for the aid of Archimond. 
And as for the Night Elves that had so far aided in the Burning Legion's efforts to take over this world, they would receive the only reward that Sargeras ever gave to such. Utter Annihilation. Balls. Malfurion had genuinely believed he'd outfoxed Xavius, with that whole tricking him into thinking he'd gone downstairs thing, but it was clearly the young Night Elf that had been played the fool. Of course Malfurion wouldn't have just cheesed it without finishing his mission. So this was it then, Malfurion thought. He'd learned much from Cenarius, but not enough to stand against such a powerful sorcerer. However, Malfurion, we're, we're still, still here. here. Our, Our strength, strength is your strength, strength. Just, just like, like inside, inside the crystal. crystal. That's, That's right. right, we're doing, we're doing the, power the power of friendship. friendship. Malfurion cringed for a moment, but it's not like he had a lot of options at the moment. So he concentrated really hard and started to sense not only Tyrande and Krasis, but also Brox now as well. You are a I'll druid, Malfurion. Perhaps, Perhaps the first of your kind. Your kind. You, you draw, draw from the world, world from, from nature. nature. So, so you, you can draw, draw from us as well. well. Yeah, alright. We get it, Krasis. Malfurion obeyed, and just in time too. Xavier's launched a spell which should have left little trace of Malfurion's spirit, but the young Night Elf just slapped it away, as if it was nothing. The Lord Counselor then struck again, angrily, but nothing. As Xavius then gestured to cast a third spell, Malfurion realised this situation could go on for a while. Bit of an impasse. He needed to think of something in order for us to move on from this scene. And he couldn't just pass out. So, Malfurion turned his attention away from the Lord Counselor, towards the portal, and several Highborn that were maintaining its form, and have totally been standing behind it this entire time. <laughs> Malfurion then sent some really strong wind or something hurtling towards those things. The highborn went flying, and the portal shimmered slightly, and twisted. But... The power of the Great One is with me. You are no match for us both. Again, self-doubt filled Malfurion's mind. It was hopeless. The combined might of Xavius and this entity of pure evil was indeed too much. Courage, Courage Druid. Druid. There, is there is another, another of us, us who's been, who's been waiting, waiting for just, just this, this moment. moment. Malfurion then felt a fourth presence join, adding its strength to the others, a significant amount of strength. I am Cariel Strauss, and, and I freely give, give what I have. have. Malfurion now felt absolutely invigorated. He could sense everything. The stones, the wind, all of the things. The power of friendship! The power of friendship. Malfurion then raised a hand, with thunder suddenly roaring outside the palace. He looked Xavius deep in the eyes, smiled, and both. Meanwhile... What the bloody hell was that noise, Captain? Is there trouble in the tower? Not that I'm aware of, Light of a Thousand Moons. Perhaps just a prelude to the Great One's arrival. Ashara's face lit up at that. You think so? In that case, I should be prepared. Surely we're in for a wonderful event. As you say, glory of our people. Would you like me to investigate? Just to be certain? No. I'm certain you're correct. Do not bother Lord Xavius. After all, I'm sure the Lord Counselor has everything in hand. And back in the tower. Impressive. If in the end futile, my young friend. You have but the power of the well on which to draw. While I also have the might of a god. That remark made Malfurion smile again. No, my lord, you've got it backwards. For you, there's only the will, and the supposed might of a demon who claims godhood. The power of the world itself is behind me. I've no more use for your babbling. Xavius then again began drawing upon the well, an immense amount of power from it, but he didn't get to finish casting his spell, because lightning suddenly struck him repeatedly, and he exploded. My fury then gave another simple gesture, causing the shield array behind him to explode as well, and then turned his attention towards the portal. You only delay the inevitable. I will devour your world, just as I have many others. You'll find us a sour treat. This is way too many explosions. Meanwhile again, Ronin felt it. A sudden surge of power. So that could only mean one thing. Malfurion had completed his mission. Immediately, he looked to Illidan, whose facial expression suggested he also felt it. The Moonguard next to him also looked pretty excited. Hell, 
all of the Night Elf defenders around the battle looked rejuvenated, and Ronin realised the Night Elves as a people must all be one with the well. Even the non-wizards. Have at them! Give them no quarter! And after only a few moments of giving them no quarter, the Night Elf army pushed the Burning Legion all the way back inside the ruined capital. However, with a somewhat reluctant expression, Lord Ravencrest signalled for the army to halt. Even with their connection to the well restored, they'd been fighting for several chapters. Illidan looked quite pissed off about it, desperately urging the Moonguard to keep going with him, but they were having none of that. While Stronin agreed with the commander. He was knackered. Ravencrest then ordered some volunteers to ride out across the Night Elf realm, to rally those they found in an effort to strengthen their force again, but also to see the extent of the devastation. After that, Ravencrest approached Illidan, immediately putting him in charge of the Moonguard from now on. Some of those Moonguard did protest a bit, but gave up because no one gave a shit what they thought. And pleased with his new status, Illidan ran over to Ronin and bragged about it. Ronin nodded politely, a little bit worried. Would this new position be good for the young Night Elf? He had great potential, but he was reckless and mental. And as the Night Elves all continued to cheer and feel really proud of themselves, Ronin then thought about the person who was actually responsible for this night's success. It wasn't him, wasn't Illidan or Ravencrest, it was Malfurion. Hopefully, that bloke was okay. And finally, is he lost to us? No, he, he can't be. He doesn't smell dead. Jared Shadowsong glanced at the red dragon, still getting used to the fact he was standing next to one. This had been a weird day. The area was charged with powerful magical forces. He could have dispersed parts of his dream self to every corner of the world. He might be able to regather himself, but the odds of that. Forgive this impertinent question, but did he at least accomplish what he hoped to? He did. Stop talking like that! Duranda then wiped a tear from her eye and gazed upwards. Miloon, Mother Moon, forgive this servant for disturbing your rest. I do not dare ask for him to be returned, but please, give us an answer as to his fate. Unfortunately, nothing. The moon did not, in fact, join them in the room and tell them anything. However, Graces then paused, looking out the window whilst narrowing his eyes. I know you're there, and I now know what you are. The forest lord then entered, directly walking towards Malfurion's physical body and Tyrande. Daughter of my dear Elune, your tears touch the heaven and the earth. I cry for him, my lord. He is a son to me, so I'm pleased he also has one like you. Tyrande's face cheeks darkened. <laughs> yes, I urge your pleas to Elune, both the spoken and unspoken ones. Cenarius then placed a hand on Malfurion's face. I walked the Emerald Dream seeking answers, and imagine my surprise when I came upon one I knew, drifting in a very dazed and confused state. Why he didn't even know himself, much less me. As Cenarius finished, a green light drifted from his hand, and Malfurion's eyes suddenly burst open. Oh, Malfurion! Seeing Tyrande filled Malfurion with joy. She was a lovely sight, the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. <clears throat> Malfurion then realised there were several others in the room, so he prevented himself from blurting out his feelings. The shield. Is it gone? For now? The Burning Legion has been held in check. Malfurion nodded. For now. Yes, the war wasn't over yet. We will fight them. We will save our world. They can be beaten. This I know. They can. But we'll need more help. We'll need the dragons. We'll need more than the dragons. And I go now to see to that. You've made me proud, my Therashan. Thank you, Shando. So, uh, is that it then? The portal is destroyed, but the Highborn can remake it. And they will. More will come, I'm afraid. A lot more.